Good evening, uh, respected seniors, uh, friends. Uh, welcome to the next session of the World Webinar of Ophthalmology, Ophthalmology Reboot uh, Version 2. Uh, we have ha already had uh, three sessions so far. Yesterday, we had cataract. Today morning, we had glaucoma. In the afternoon, we had the UVI, UVI session. Uh, and now we are going into the uh, pediatric ophthalmology and neuro-ophthalmology session. Uh, we have, uh, just like in all other sessions, we have national and international stalwarts speaking to us today. This session is uh, headed by uh, none other than Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir, along with Dr. Rohit Saxena. And we have Dr. Nina and Dr. Thomas Arun from Cochin, uh, who will be moderating the session. So I request uh, Dr. Gopal to briefly introduce the session and the main speakers, and then we can start. Gopal, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sai. It's indeed a pleasure to be amongst the doyens of this field of pediatric ophthalmology and neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, and uh, we are in the fourth uh, session of the program. As Dr. Sai said yesterday, was cataract, which was seen by about 2,000 people. And today morning was uh, glaucoma and then uveitis. And uh, immediately after the uveitis, we are now starting the pediatric ophthalmology program. And I'm sure that this three, three and a half hours that is going to be there, we will go through all the phases of uh, uh, pediatric and neuro-ophthalmology. The basic idea is 360 degree ophthalmology revision in these seven sessions. And for a postgraduate fellow or even a comprehensive ophthalmologist, revising the whole of ophthalmology as a capsule is a very important thing. So let me just start by uh, uh, bringing out this. Uh, this is our pediatric ophthalmology session. So, uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma does not require any introduction to any gathering, uh, actually, but he's my teacher, he's ex-professor and head uh, Strabismus Pediatric Ophthalmology and Neuro-Ophthalmology at RP Center and has now uh, joined the uh, Center for Sight. Uh, he's the, uh, he's uh, been a uh, gold medalist throughout and uh, a member of the National Academy of Medical Sciences and the fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, fellowship in uh, multiple places, you know, all with all the uh, big people in strabismology. He is trained and he has more than 250 scientific articles. And he was a section editor of Strabismus Neuroophthalmology, Indian Journal of uh, Ophthalmology, and a reviewer of multiple international journals. And he has uh, uh, innumerable uh, you know, uh, podium presentations in regional, national, international conferences. Uh, so then we have... Uh, Next, we have uh, Dr. Rohit. One second. My slide is not moving. You can ask Nia to share if you want. Oh, it's okay. I'll just uh, make it uh, off screen. Do you want me to share? If you stop sharing, uh, I can share. No problem. Uh, okay. Okay, Rohit Saxena is our um, co-chairman. Uh, he is also uh, from RP Center, MBBS and MD from RP Center and PhD. And he's professor and in charge of Strabismus and Neuroophthalmology. And he has more than 130 index publications of the two books and written 32 chapters, attended and presented more than 250 national conferences, reviewer in 10 international index publications and received 30 awards and research and academic contributions. Next then we have our moderators, Dr. Nina R, who is the senior consultant and head pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus and neuro-ophthalmology at the Giridharai Hospital, Cochin. She had her MBBS and, RI, uh, and uh, MS from uh, RIO Trivandrum, and she had the Ratan Tata Fellowship from Shankar Netralaya, and pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus also from Shankar Netralaya. She actually worked in Shankar Netralaya, Kolkata as an associate consultant, Pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus, and neuroophthalmology. And she has multiple publications and uh, organized workshops and webinars at the state, national, and international platforms. Winner of the best case presentation at the uh, SPOC AFPOS, uh, annual CME at Jaipur, Shankar Menon Award for the best paper in Kerala in KSOS Trishti 2018. And she has over 17 years of teaching and clinical experience and reviewer of the Asia Pacific Journal of Ophthalmology. 
Dr. Thomas Arun Varghese is our scientific committee chairman of the Cochin of Thailand Club. She's the MS FRCS MRC of Thailand FICO in glaucoma. And uh, he is glaucoma and neuroophthalmology consultant at Dr. Jacobs, Alphonse Apala, Dr. St. Joseph Eye Hospital, Kanyarapilli. He has 10 years of experience in UK where he had the best paper award from the Welsh Ophthalmic Forum in 2004, best poster synapse synapse neuroophthalmology seminar in 2016. And he is a speaker at many of the national and international conferences and our state quiz master. So these are our uh, moderators. And I give the stage to Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir, whose book is our Bible. So, uh, so that is what we all learn now. Uh, I think most people read Dr. Pradeep Sharma's book than one note nowadays. Over to you, sir. Over to you, Nina. So thank you, Gopal, for uh, having such a lively session that you have, this worldwide ophthalmic revision. It's really a great thing for the postgraduates, and they are going to thoroughly uh, benefit from it. And we have a, a wonderful star list of uh, the speakers. Uh, I wouldn't be coming in between them. So we'll start in the right earnest to uh, begin our job that we have to do. And I'll first of all have Dr. Satish Thomas, who is going to tell us about the refraction and prescription of glasses. Uh, is it change? No. Uh, no, sir. Nina will just introduce. Okay. Dr. Nina will be uh, yeah. introducing. Yeah. 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 Dr. Nina, unmute, please. You are muted, Nina. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for that. Yeah, am I audible and visible? The screen is visible? Yes. Yes. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Satish Thomas. He's currently the professor and head of ophthalmology at Believers Church Medical College, Tiruvalla. And uh, he's a uh, former professor and head at CMC Luthiana. He's an alumni of RP Center Ames, as well as uh, he completed, he's an alumni of Shankar Netralia Chennai also. He had a stint at Children's, West Ho Children's Hospital, West Mid, Sydney. He was instrumental in setting up the Orbit uh, Pediatric Ophthalmology Unit at CMC Luthiana. He has publications in international and national journals and is an invited speaker on strabismus and pediatric cataract and pediatric ophthalmology at various platforms. He's also interestingly a bioethicist, having done an MA in bioethics from Trinity International University, Chicago. So over to you, Dr. Satish, uh, for your talk on refraction and prescription of glasses. Uh, thank you, Nina. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me to share a platform with uh, luminaries in our field and uh, especially my teacher, uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma and my dear friend, uh, Rohit Saxena. Uh, let me share my screen. So my talk will be on the intricacies of spectacle prescription and uh, refraction in children. So it's a 10 minute talk, so I'll be rushing through much of it. Uh, I'll not go into the details of uh, refraction, but we'll be mostly covering how do we uh, choose the spectacles, a spectacle prescription after we've uh, had the refraction. So uh, spectacle prescription in children can be a tricky business. And uh, uh, obviously we can give the wrong prescription and try and uh, get around it by telling that uh, you will adjust. But uh, <clears throat> uh, spectacle prescription in children is tricky because children have unique visual needs. Uh, uh, so it can depend upon their condition, the global situ uh, uh, situation they are in, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the diagnosis, the age group, and things like that. In adults, most uh, often, Spectacle prescription is a straightforward decision uh, based upon the difference between the uncorrected and the corrected visual equity. Now we cannot use that criteria for children most often because we do not, uh, we are not able to obtain uh, the visual equity in the pre-verbal children, or even when we uh, uh, get them in the young children, it may not be quite reliable. 
And also we all know that um, um, in contrast to adults, a cycloplegic retinoscopy is mandatory if we uh, need to get a proper refraction for, uh, for children. The visual demands for children are different um, uh, based upon their age and upon uh, their condition. Uh, that makes it different, um, the choice of the spectacle prescription. And also the other big difference in children is that their accommodation reserve is much higher. And that would again depend upon the age group. So all these factors have to be uh, considered when we are choosing the PAR. And probably the most important consideration uh, to keep in mind is the risk of amblyopia. Uh, because uh, uh, most uh, other things we can uh, get away with uh, without doing permanent damage by giving a good prescription later on. But in children, if we give a wrong prescription at a point in time, we might do a permanent damage to them. The level of refractive error that produces amblyopia for, for each particular child can be different. There's no firm evidence-based recommendation regarding the threshold levels of refractive error that need correction to protect against amblyopia. Therefore, spectacle prescribing for children is an art as much as it is a science. Most recommendations are based on the preferred practice patterns of pediatric ophthalmologists and optometrists. And therefore, it is the thinking process that these, uh, the pediatric ophthalmologists and optometrists employ that becomes important in, uh, uh, in a talk like this. So that's what I'll be trying to do in this talk. So indications for spectacle treatment, again, there can be an out of the box indication uh, like uh, a legitimate discussion uh, indication like this child. I need a pair of glasses to stop the big boys hitting me and the little girls kissing me. Uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. But we are looking at indications that, um, um, that can affect the child's uh, visual growth. And therefore the most important questions that need to be on our mind uh, when we are uh, uh, giving a spectacle prescription are these four. One, is the refractive error that I'm dealing with in this child within the normal range for the child's age? Secondly, will this level of refractive error disrupt the normal visual development? Will prescribing spectacles improve the visual function of this particular child? And finally, will prescribing the glasses interfere with the normal process of immetropization? So we need to keep these four questions in mind uh, when we look at the refractive error that we obtain before prescribing it. So indications for treatment, obviously, to improve the visual acuity. But as I said, that may not be the top consideration uh, that will help us prescribe when we are dealing with young children. We need to ask, the, uh, uh, we are is, uh, prescribing spectacles in order to enable the visual development or to prevent amblyopia. This is where pediatric prescriptions differ from an adult prescription uh, to correct the strabismus or to preserve the binocularity. So these are the indications for prescribing spectacles. First, we look at the refractive situations. So we need to uh, know the normal refractive findings uh, in a child in the uh, normal age group before we prescribe. So the mean refractive error of a newborn is plus two diopters, plus or minus two uh, uh, diopters. And hyperopia normally increases up to the seventh year of age before it immetropizes by adolescence. Myopia increases from eight to 13 years. 20% of newborns have an astigmatism of greater than one diopter, which decreases as they grow. And the accommodative reserve is high in children. It's about 14 diopters at eight years and then reduces by one diopter every four years until age 40. So it's important to keep these normal physiological things in mind so that we do not uh, um, break what is normal 
uh, and go along with that flow. Coming to prescription in myopia. Bilateral symmetric myopia doesn't cause amblyopia generally because of preservation of the near point of vision. So we can prescribe in myopia based upon the anticipated visual needs of the child. Working distance is quite small for young children and therefore we can undercorrect and we need to move towards full correction only once they are in school and need to see the blackboard at a distance. So when we have um, bilateral myopia, um, which is um, of a fairly um, similar number, then the um, prescription would be uh, the preferred practice patterns of the American Academy of Ophthalmologists and Optometrists, uh, what I have put up here. So they generally recommend that if the child is an infant, less than one year of age, you need to prescribe myopia only if it is greater than five diopters or four diopters in bracket is the uh, uh, optometry recommendation. Because uh, the, these children need, uh, they're not walking and therefore they need to see only a few feet away. Once they start walking, then the threshold drops a bit. You start prescribing when the myopia is greater than four diopters. And as they become older and need to see further, then you start prescribing um, at a uh, lower threshold. Coming to hypermetropic prescription, the first question to ask is, are we going to prescribe for a hypermetrope to improve the visual acuity or to alleviate esotropia? Because we're thinking of accommodative esotropia. So we can give a symmetric reduction of 1.5 to 2 diopters of spherical hypermetropia if there is no esotropia because they have good accommodative reserve. And uh, we, however, we give a full correction in case of esotropia, which is thought to be accommodative. So that's the difference. And in amblyopia, again, we give closer to the full correction because the amblyopic eyes cannot accommodate as well as a uh, non-amblyopic eye. So again, these, these are the uh, uh, preference practice patterns. Hyperopia, less than one year, you prescribe only if it is above six diopters. One to two years, prescribe above five diopters and so on. But if there is esotropia, then your threshold is lower. There are concerns about the effect of spectacle correction for hypermetropia on the eventual immetropization of the eye. When you prescribe, uh, are you interfering with the normal immetropization? So immetropization is a combination of the active uh, and passive growth factors, uh, active and passive factors, which are the visual feedback and the growth factors, which during the development of the visual system guide the refractive error towards my uh, immetropia. However, studies both support and oppose the notion that correction of hypermetropia might affect immetropization. Astigmatism of less than 1.5 diopters produces minimal visual degradation in a young child and the, therefore doesn't have to be corrected if it is symmetric. If astigmatism is balanced by a spherical refractive error, then the spherical equivalent places the conoid of sturm nicely on the retina and therefore we it's, it's, it's okay to give a spherical equivalent. So these are the numbers for astigmatism. So uh, parents can be told that if the astigmatism is small, they needn't fuss too much over it. They needn't stress themselves out if the child is not wearing the specs all the time. In older children, we can go by the subjective refraction to prescribe astigmatism. In anisometropia, if you compare it with the previous chart where I put it for isometropia, you can see that the threshold is lower because then the eye with the higher power can become amblyopic. So therefore we prescribe at a lower threshold if there is an isometropia. So these charts are available um, easily online from the American Academy uh, sites. Now quickly to the strabismic situations and how we would prescribe spectacles. These are the most important strabismic situations where spectacles can have um, uh, a relation. 
accommodative isotropia, high AC by AC ratio isotropia and intermittent exo. So if it is accommodative isotropia, we give the full correction of hypermetropia. And for high AC by A ratio isotropia, we give bifocals if the near deviation is more than 10 to 15 prism diopters. In intermittent exo, we give the full correction uh, uh, for distance, full correction of myopia and astigmatism. And if it is hypermetropia, then we can uh, undercorrect it. Overcorrection of myopia is controversial. Um, it, it, the benefit is only temporary and it can produce asthenopia and even non-compliance. So my last uh, slide, protection, the prescribing of polycarbonate lenses in a monocular sighted child should be standard procedure. And the protection of the non-amblyopic eye is a policy statement of uh, American Academy of uh, Ophthalmology, Pediatrics and the APOS. There is no recommendation for blue light filtering lenses for screen use. This has become um, a craze nowadays, but uh, uh, there is no real recommendation. Most of the symptoms are mostly related to the computer vision syndrome and the reduced blinking. So to conclude, the important factors for a clinician before prescribing spectacles in a child is to be aware of the developmental and refractive changes in children, to know the refractive and strabismic situations that necessitate spectacles, and finally, to decide whether the indications for our eyeglasses outweigh the reasons not to prescribe them. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Satish, for that lucid talk. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir, you want to uh, put in any comment? Uh, just carry on, yeah. So do we have time for discussion in between or we'll... Uh... So I think we can take one or two questions if they're around. Otherwise, we can take it at the end. Okay. So there is one question which I've got uh, on WhatsApp uh, from one of our PGs is, uh, how do we avoid uh, prismatic uh, you know, changes in high-powered glasses? So sometimes we give uh, fake glasses or high myopic lenses. So how do we make sure that there is no prismatic uh, induction in these high-powered glasses? So the induced prismatic effect would be there with any high powered glasses, whether it's myopic or aphakic. And especially if there is a, a squint, which is causing a decentration, then there would be an induced prismatic effect. In normal people with orthotropic eyes also, there will be a, if there are decentered glasses, it will induce a prismatic uh, deviation and cause a false squint. So one should be careful while prescribing. For normal people, make sure that the IPD is corrected. So whenever prescription is given, the IPD should be corrected as per the child's uh, interpupillate distance for the glasses. And for the people who are having squint, then we should be taking uh, into account the tables which are available in the books, which are for the correction, taking into account the, how much is the power of the prescriptive glasses and the deviation. So those uh, tables are available and there are otherwise there are formulas which are available in most of the books. Right. Thank you, sir. Do we move to the next speaker? Nina, you are going to introduce? Yeah, uh, Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Gopal has already introduced Dr. Rohit and he's going to talk to us about how to work up a patient of strabismus. So over to you, Dr. Rohit. Thank you, Dr. Nina. Uh, my slides are visible? Yes, they are visible. Thank you. Um, uh, at the very outset, thank you, uh, Coaching Ophthalmic Club, Dr. Gopal, uh, Dr. Sai, and everybody for doing such an excellent uh, setup and having uh, such comprehensive review of all specialities. I'll be talking about strabismus workup, which uh, has been considered a challenge, but if done carefully and in basic steps are remembered, it's not so much of a challenge. At the start, I'll just talk about that everything we'll be talking in my talk and in subsequent talks can actually be put into in one of this in one of these boxes in the table. So we have squint. Your squint can be apparent or pseudo squint. It can be latent squint and it can be manifest squint. The manifest squint can be a comitant squint, which essentially mean that the eyes move together. 
despite the fact that there is a squint. So it's like a zero error, which is constant at all times. So the eyes will have the same deviation or the deviation between them in all cases. Whereas in comatant squint, the deviation changes and is more in the direction of gaze where there is the problem like a paretic squint where the peresis is more evident. Incompetent squints can be paretic, paralytic in origin, restrictive in origin, or very, very rarely spastic. So essentially, these are all these squints that more or less we uh, work up or look at. So when you, when you examine or you work up a patient of strabismus, your important questions are, what are your initial complaints? Many patients have a long history of strabismus, which was missed. They come with a long history of asthenopia. They've been given exercises and all. But in truth, if you look at them carefully, they may have a congenital superior oblique palsy. And when they look in down gaze, especially after reading for, for a period of time, they start having a headache, asthenopia. And it's they keep on doing exercises, convergence fusional exercises with no avail. So it's important to go into what exactly are, our compl are the complaints diplopia, strabismus, what's the age of onset, earlier onset, longer duration and a constant angle is poorer binocular prognosis and also the increased risk of amblyopia. When in doubt, ask for childhood photographs. What is the pattern of the deviation, whether it's intermittent, constant, is the same eye constantly squinting or is alternating? Again, important in a small child where you want to suspect whether there is amblyopia or not. Is there any precipitating factor like trauma or fever? Many times this may not be directly as an etiology, but may have resulted in a, a weaker child or weaker uh, fusional virgins precipitating the strabismus. So there may not be a direct fever responsible for a nerve palsy, but a precipitation of a comatant squint. And of course, recently we have seen a large number of acute comatant esotropias presenting because of an additional near work that is going on in the COVID times. You need to know the developmental history because a lot of children have developmental issues along with their strabismus, which may be the presenting feature, but the parent is not discussing the developmental details or is not concerned at the moment because the child is young and first time parents may not know the delay in development of a child. And of course, finally, is there any treatment that the child has undergone? A visual assessment is key, as has been talked about by Dr. Satish, and it depends upon the age of the child, the comprehension of the child, and a variety of visual assessment methods are available. Older children, you can use Snellens as for adults, but for younger children, you have options of Teller, Cardiff, optokinetic drum, even a VER pattern may help you sometimes to estimate vision. Always keep attractive objects, keep the environment uh, less threatening, try to, of course, now we need to wear masks and often PPE, but otherwise a comfortable smiling face is a great comfort for children. Your diagnosing amblyopia is not so difficult if the child is verbal and is able to speak and read out, but in a small child, you can just see the resistance of covering either eye that can show that the child is amblyopia. So there is no resistance on covering the left eye, but the moment the right eye is covered, the child is extremely aggressive, knowing, showing that there is left amblyopia in this child. Of course, in the presence of squint, a fixed squint will tell us, a constant squint of one eye would tell us that that eye is most likely gone into amblyopia. Refraction again has been discussed, but the importance for strabismus cannot be overemphasized. Accommodative esotropias, partially accommodative esotropias, we know are very important, but even for divergent squints, we know that an intermittent divergent squint becomes a constant divergent squint just because the vision is poor and the eye does not get good quality images to fuse. So it's important to give good quality refractive correction for them to control, fusionally control their deviation. Head postures, look the moment the child walks in, is there a head posture? Parents often scold children to keep their head posture correct. So in the presence of a parent, the child may consciously not adapt the head posture, which may guide us towards the possibility of what squint the child may be having. A lid move, lid changes, palpable fissure changes are important, particularly uh, in, in a case of duans where the retraction can help, may help us to guide in a small child, whether it's a six nerve palsy or a duans and um, um, avoid unnecessary repeat investigations, including imaging. Uh, when you're measuring corneal, uh, the eye deviation, the Hirschberg or the corneal light reflex can give us a good estimate. It is based on the first Purkinje images and may tell us the amount of deviation. In fact, the presence and the amount of deviation. 
but it's important because looks can be deceptive. Uh, it's important that from far, uh, if you're looking, you need to see the eye, the corneal light reflexes. Like in this case, from far, the child looks an isotrope because of the epicanthal folds and uh, the adenoxyl positions. However, when you look at the light reflex, it's well centered. So it's important to rule out pseudo strabismus in children when they present to you. You uh, use a cover test to pick up tropias, which is a true squint. So the cover is placed over the eye, which appears to fixate so that the apparently deviating eye moves to take up fixation. It should be done for both distance and near and is a way to pick up true strabismus. But of course, the eye should be able to fixate at the target, should have some central good vision, central fixation and no motility defect that will prevent the eye from moving to take up fixation. For uh, latent strabismus or heterophorias, we use the cover uncover or the alternate cover test in which any one of the eye can be covered. And the uncover process is the important one where we see for the deviation of the eye when the fusion has been disrupted due to the cover. You measure deviation for both distance and near. For distance, you use, use a six nine target or one line less than the best corrected visual acuity to control the accommodation and do not use a torch for near. Again, use an accommodative target for near also. Measure deviation both for distance and for near to pick up any distance near disparity, which may need to be managed if the child is undergoing surgery. Do the deviations for up gaze and nine, uh, down gaze so that you can look for A and V patterns that may be there in any competent strabismus. A uh, prism bar cover test is the measurement of the actual deviation. Use a fixation target for distance and for near. Dissociate both the eyes for the complete deviation apex of the prism towards the deviation, gradually increase the prism with alternate cover test. And the end point is no movement on alternate cover test. In fact, you can cross check by going a little higher and seeing for the reversal of the deviation and then come back to the actual end point, which is no movement. But it's important that in children, they get distracted very soon and may not actually be looking at the target and may be looking elsewhere and you may measure an, a, a wrong uh, a deviation. In eyes which do not have good vision, you can use a Krimsky or a prism reflex test. So you can either uh, center the reflex using a prism or you can move the other eye with prisms and center the reflex on the deviating eye. Ocular movements are very important. You need to do both ductions, which are uniocular eye movements and versions. Like in this case, you can see the child is cross fixating, looking at the torch with the left eye when it's on the right side and with the right eye on the left side. But the moment you, duct you do ductions, you can see there is no limitation of movement. So it's a comitant squint with cross fixation instead of bilateral lateral rectus palsy. Do not miss the obliques, uh, both inferior obliques. And you can see a V pattern. You see a pattern, you see for the cause. So a V pattern, look for inferior oblique overactions. You look, you see an A pattern. You look for superior oblique overactions. For incompetent squints, you need to see the head posture, do the measurements in nine gazes, diplopia charting, HES charting, and post duction post generation tests and circadian velocities. So diplopia charting is done in dark room. Use a slit light source, not just a torch. You need to put a slit in front of the torch so that the patient can even tell us about torsional deviation and vertical and horizontal deviations. So this is how you, you will measure. You can see that the, there is a lateral rectus under action. And on levo version, you can see that there is a diplopia which is increasing in dextro version. There is no diplopia. So this is diplopia charting. You can do a HES charting or a LEES charting. And this is how it charts. This is the, the smaller squares depict the under action. And you can see that here, the superior oblique is under acting in the left eye. So this is a left fourth nerve palsy. You need to differentiate between restrictive and a paralytic muscle. So you do the test of saccadic velocities, force duction and active force generation. You see the quick saccades that are there in the right eye. When we do the left eye, uh, you can see for adduction, it's good. But when she abducts, they are floating movements and not as rapid saccades as they normally are. So this is important when you're looking for comparison between paresis and uh, restriction. Again, to rule out restriction, you, you do a forced adduction test. You rotate the eye in the direction of limitation. And if you can move it beyond the limitation, you know that the forced adduction test is free. And if the FDT is positive, that is, there is a restriction to find out if the muscle which is underacting has any strength or not, you need to do the active force generation test and assess the power in the paralyzed 
muscle looking for the voluntary effort by the patient and you feel for the tug uh, on your forceps. Sensory status, you can measure by the Bagalini stride glasses, look for a cross response, the worth four dot test by using red green goggles and the worth four dot is available on all Snellen's chart. And of course the sign up to four and the after image test. Uh, you need to do a lot of the binocularity. If there is binocularity, you need to do the stereopsis test, both for distance and near if possible. And of course, it will tell us the status of stereopsis, especially in patients who have control like intermittent divergence squints. And finally, you need to measure torsion if the patient has a cyclovertical uh, palsy or if there are oblique overactions, you can see, which can be done by the subjective methods by using double Maddox rod or synoptophores or uh, objective methods like indirect ophthalmoscopy or fundus photography. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Dr. Rohit, for that uh, uh, you know, excellent presentation with very nice videos, uh, which actually demonstrated well all the uh, important techniques and uh, the tests which we use in strabismus the cover test, the uh, uncover test, and post-duction, post-generation. I think it was self-explanatory. So uh, I just wanted to ask you one question. Uh, so in this COVID times, we are also seeing a lot of children who are coming with acute onset of esotropia. Uh, so there are, I see two types of patients. One of them, uh, some of them are having uh, esotropia more for distance than for near. There is one group of patients with small esotropia, which is more for distance than for near. There's another group who are having uh, more or less similar deviation. So how, uh, I mean, what are your, uh, how do you, uh, work of these patients? So um, uh, firstly, of course, uh, uh, generally the ones we have seen are the ones which are acute comitant type, which would have relatively similar differences, a distance and near deviation. Uh, it's important, of course, uh, uh, to first to rule out other causes rather than just associate them with the increased near work that is happening. Now children are on the laptop or near related work for uh, six to seven hours. So that uh, may be giving a strain on their fusional divergence, which is causing a precipitation of uh, the esophoria that they may be having to start off with. So, uh, but however, the first step would be to rule out an accommodative esotropia. You must do uh, an age appropriate cycloplegic refraction. And we, for one, would always use atropine uh, as a cycloplegic agent. It's very important we use atropine ointment three times a day for three days. It can be cumbersome, but it's very, very essential to rule out accommodative component in these children because after all, they have been using uh, accommodational near work for a very long period of time. So uh, cycloplegic refraction uh, and prescribe the glasses after a period of time, uh, evaluate them. Firstly, advise the glasses to be worn immediately. Do not wait for a, post, uh, a PMT in these patients. Uh, you prescribe them immediately, even if they are older children who can be called for a PMT. So prescribe as per etnoscopy, just remove the working distance and do not reduce for the atropine and ask them to be worn immediately or as early as possible so that the eye uh, does not get a chance to go back into ciliary spasm and then reevaluate and see for any change in the amount of deviation. If it is, if the deviation remains the same despite the glasses, of course, a fundus examination should be done. We must, uh, I mean, I, as of now, I am doing an imaging in all these patients, doing an MRI to rule out any brainstem anomaly, which can be associated in a, a small percentage of these conditions. Uh, fortunately, in this recent pa uh, pandemic time, I have not found any patient who has been positive uh, for any intracranial pathology. So it uh, appears that it is possibly due to the uh, increase near work. But uh, I, like I said, I would still err on the side of caution in these children. And subsequently, if uh, despite all this, uh, the deviations remain, I would follow them up for about uh, two months on a monthly follow up and see for the change in deviation. If there is none, then I would uh, go ahead and plan for surgery. Of course, uh, to prevent that, you need to ask them to take adequate breaks. Uh, the 20-20-20 rule of uh, the academy and the APOS, and of course, uh, the other advantages of uh, taking breaks, going out into the distance, looking out into the distance, uh, those are the you know general health advice 
a bright, bright lit room, do not have a dark room. The contrast between your screen and the environment should not be very strong. Of course, advise them to blink to take, uh, you know, adequate uh, nutrition and uh, hydration. So these are the major, you know, basic workup, which I think is essential when we, when these children present. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Pradeep Sharma, sir, you want to add on anything for the, to that? He's nicely talked about the basic things. You can just remember one more thing that usually those who have an accommodation spasm based esotropia, they would also have a change in the refractive error. So mm -hmm. they would also be complaining of diminution of vision, which you can then cross check. And also the uh, near uh, point of accommodation mm -hmm. can be another uh, telltale thing. So you can do a proper age appropriate cycloplegia as Rohit correctly mentioned. And atropine usually we prefer for any case less than five and even older ones, if they have a, a strong sp uh, spasm related uh, feeling that we have, then we can use atropine even for the older children. Do you routinely do an orthoptic evaluation for these children, sir? Uh, yeah, we would, we would see their deviations. I mean, you would be obviously seeing whenever a patient comes and the, with esotropia. So you'll be looking for that and always look for the vision. We will, of course, be looking as a part of it. Just need to have a near point of accommodation, which will be helpful. And if you see that the near point accommodation has reduced, then it means there is an accommodation spasm. Some children I have found also have a, a relation to some sort of um, psychological thing that even with the, uh, I mean, counseling they don't have. So some of them I have sent to even a psychological counseling. So they have such a strong accommodation spasm that it needs more, uh, just not the correction of reflective error, but also a counseling. Thank you, sir. So shall we move on to the next talk? Are there any more questions? So I think uh, we can move on to the next talk. So I invite uh, Dr. Saumya R uh, to present uh, her talk on advances in the management of amblyopia. I just briefly introduce you, Saumya. Don't share your screen. Sure, Nina. Yeah. So, uh, so I have great pleasure in introducing uh, Dr. Saumya R. She's currently working as a consultant at Shankara Eye Hospital in the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus at Bangalore. Uh, she has done her undergraduation and postgraduation from Mysore, and uh, she did her fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at Shankara Nitravya, Chennai. And I'm happy to tell you that we were colleagues during that time at Chennai. And uh, she's very active in uh, teaching and mentoring students, especially DNB students and fellows at her institute. And she has been instrumental in organizing the annual PG update program at her institute uh, for the last nine years. She was the recipient of the Best Video Award at SPOSI 2016 and the Best Paper in the Karnataka State Conference in Optics in 2018. She has about 12 to 14 publications in various index journals. And over to you, Samia, for your talk. Thank you, Nina. Um, is the screen visible to everybody? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a very good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you, Dr. Rohit sir and uh, Dr. Gopal, coaching of Thermic Club, for having me here. Uh, very happy and glad to be a part of this uh, panel of esteemed speaker. Uh, after we have uh, seen about uh, or heard about refraction and a very lucid talk uh, from Dr. Rohit regarding the evaluation of squint, I would be discussing a little on advances in the management of amblyopia. I would be covering the talk under the following headings. Let's understand why do we have uh, recent advances is basically because of our recent uh, understanding about the concepts in the pathophysiology of amblyopia, the binocular modalities, which are the newer way to go about, the other experimental modalities, which are being basically uh, used in animals or experimented in animals, our experience at Shankara with binocular therapy, is there any newer ways to assess the amblyopia uh, improvement or the treatment of amblyopia? Finally, the take home. So what is a newer understanding in amblyopia? Newer in the sense it's been there for a decade or so. 
So it's basically a fundamentally a binocular disorder. So when it is a binocular disorder, even when we are dealing with uniocular amblyops, earlier it was thought that the binocular processes were irretrievably lost after the critical period of visual development. And like now, where we know that the binocular processes are basically intact, but are suppressed. So the monocularity in amblyops is finally a functional abnormality rather than a structural abnormality. So when the adult visual systems also show a plasticity, if we are able to reverse the suppression in ways more than one, we are able to restore the binocular functions. And this restoration on binocular function will have a secondary effect in terms of improving the visual acuity. So that basically, the degree of neuroplasticity extends well beyond the sensitive period as was thought earlier. So therapeutic approaches can be in the form of binocular therapy. It could be perceptual learning. It could be in the form of video games. It could be in terms of experimental evidences which show environmental enrichment or exercise and visual motor engagement or other uh, forms of therapy in terms of transcranial stimulations, which have also shown promising results. Let's look at perceptual learning. Perceptual learning basically implies that practice makes perfect. If you are repeatedly exposed to a particular array, the discernment of the stimulus array becomes better. That is the basis of uh, perceptual learning. The various visual tasks which can be used is in terms of vernier acuity, a Gabber patches detection, positional discrimination, letter identification or position discrimination in noise and contrast detection. Here in perceptual learning, it's a single visual percept which is administered to both the eyes simultaneously or under monocular viewing condition. This becomes important in contrast to the binocular therapies which we'll be discussing subsequently. So this is the image of the Gabers, Gabbers patch, which is most commonly used in perceptual learning. Why or how does it work is basically thought to reduce lateral inhibition at the early visual processing or um, reduce the internal noise, which is inherent to amblyopia, or could be at the level of the cognitive learning process itself. A recent study also showed on functional MRI and DTI, DTI imaging, which showed activation in the areas of Broadman and bilateral temporal lobes after perceptual learning. So these are basically the ways by which perceptual learning probably could be acting on. The evidence for perceptual learning is uh, much older. And uh, even in 77 adult amplitude, the gain in visual acuity had been noticed. The Liu Wei and Li uh, looked at, is this learning or the gain in the visual acuity, which was noticed, sustained? And they found that the uh, sustenance of the visual acuity also is seen. Uh, there is another uh, technique in perceptual learning, which they had looked at in terms of push-pull protocol, which not only pushed the amblyopic eye to function better, but also reduce the dominant sensory dominance of the dominant eye. But the various criticisms against this perceptual learning is all the studies have smaller numbers of study participants. The task gains are very specific to the uh, therapy that they have been administered rather than to a novel situation. The sustenance of this visual acuity improvement is not very clear and the lack of long-term follow-up uh, puts this perceptual learning probably not the uh, important aspect in terms of amblyopia therapy. The other aspect is liquid crystal glasses, which are basically electronic and control occlusion of the normal eye. This basically has an on and off mode where the dominant eye is either occluded completely, that is on situation where the light is not let into, or off where the light transmits across. It's similar to patching, but it's only done electronically. A study which was done comparing this with the patching showed greater improvement or in par improvement with patching in the age group of three to eight years, specifically in moderate amplio. And uh, its applicability to other forms of amplio is not very clearly known. From liquid crystal glasses, they tried out something called as itronic flicker glasses, where the occlusion was not just done in the dominant eye, but alternated between the dominant and the non-dominant eye, and seen if this could maintain the binocularity better and the visual acuity improvement better. But the study did not show any promising results versus patching, so this is not commonly used. The next important thing is about binocular therapy. When we refer to binocular therapy, what we are try, uh, aiming to say is this is any treatment where both the eyes are being used, but the primary eye being used is the amblyopic eye, which sees or performs a visual task. It basically works on three principles, either as an anti-suppression therapy or a balanced binocular viewing or an interactive binocular treatment system. This is basically thought to overcome the interocular suppression, reduces the extent of suppression, depth of suppression, thus improves stereo acuity. And this stereo acuity would secondarily act uh, benefit in terms of visual acuity. This is basically done with the help of using a high contrast, high luminance input to the amblyopic eye and a low contrast, low luminance in input to the fellow eye. 
So binocular therapy could be in terms of dicoptic therapy. It could be an IBIT system or an interactive binocular uh, therapy system. It could be delivered through a virtual reality headset, either as an Oculus Rift or a Binovision. It could be a balanced binocular viewing, or it could be a mono, monocular fixation in binocular field, which has recently been explored, and the passive binocular therapy. Now a word about dicoptic therapy. Dicoptic, the word refers to there is a simultaneous and a separate stimulation of both the eyes. As essentially, the dominant eye receives a low contrast image and the non-dominant eye receives a high contrast image. The dominant eye receives the contrast is reduced to such an extent that the uh, input is balanced between the two eyes and the given visual task can be completed. So this contrast balancing basically improves the stereopsis and binocularity with a secondary effect of improving the visual acuity in the amblyopic eye. So dicoptic therapy is known to reduce the active inhibition of the cortical inputs from the amblyopic eye. It also reduces the suppression and the contrast attenuation. So by all this means, dicoptic therapy is supposed to be working in terms of amblyopic. Unlike an interactive binocular uh, treatment system, which is basically an in-office therapy, uses a virtual reality um, head-mounted system, it combines both an active game and a passive visualization of movie clips. Here, what happens is uh, when the child is watching a game, the screen basically has a shutter glass which lightens and darkens, which at a very great frequency. So there is a common visual background which both the eye perceives with an enriched image going only to the amblyopic eye and thus improving the or stimulating the amblyopic eye. Uh, this is basically of the anti-separation uh, technique. It's using anaglyph glasses, the red and green glasses, through the red glasses or the one of the eye. The right eye, the patient sees basically the red targets and through the blue, it sees the blue target. So finding the matching images is one of the ways in which the anti-separation works. The other binocular therapies could be in terms of balanced binocular viewing system. This is interesting because here it is uh, passively watching a movie 3D. Apart from that, there will be at every minute, there is an interactive game which measures the suppression. Second thing would be binovision. Here, uh, a variety or array of um, children's favorite television shows or games, which are on the personal computer are viewed through a head-mounted video goggle system. So there's a uh, the amount of video games which could be played on or the movies could be watched on is much more compared to the routine games which are used on an Oculus Rift or a virtual he reality headset or a binocular passive therapy. Instead of using an active games like an adventure game, they've also tried using a passive therapy like using or uh, seeing videos with a binocular method. And that has also showed promising results. The next important thing would be video games, just to view the video games. The important uh, study comes with a binocular treatment of amblyopia using video games. That's a Bravo study. Uh, the study did not show promising results with the video games per se. So what we have or what understanding of uh, the binocular treatment of amblyopia, it's a report published in AAO recently looking, looking at um, all the published literature to assess the efficacy of binocular therapy. Uh, first, they looked at... Uh, the binocular treatment versus sham games. They basically classify the studies as level one, level two, and level three study. Level one study is basically being well-designed, well-conducted RCTs or randomized control trial. Level two being well-designed case cohort, cohort studies or case control study. Uh, the level one RCT, which is Herbison study, which looked at binocular treatment versus sham games, uh, did not show any difference between you know, using a placebo game or a sham game versus a binocular treatment. A recent study by in 2018 by Gao et al, again looking at a falling block game versus a sham game, again did not show any promising results. So there is no level one RCT showing a superiority of a binocular treatment versus a sham game per se. Holmes et al study, which is in 2019, which is basically a part of EDIC study, looked at adventure games like Dig Rush, where they looked at binocular treatment versus optical treatment. This EDIC study um, was in favor of patching. So they, they did not show any uh, difference between binocular treatment versus an optical treatment per se. The interesting study comparing a binocular treatment versus patching comes from Kelly et al study, which is a level one RCT again, but this showed a superior result with a dicoptic therapy versus a patching per se. This was a crossover trial. The group of um, children played uh, adventure games. After two weeks, they, they were shifted on to patching and the second group which played patching first uh, received dicoptic therapy later on. So the first group which received dicoptic therapy showed promising improvement much earlier compared to the ones which had received uh, patching, late, patching first and the crossover group caught up with the first group much later. 
And the other uncontrolled study, and the important ones being Hess et al. study, which looked at dicoptic falling therapy uh, thing. And this is a level three study in terms of it being a case series or a case report, not having a, um, a control per se. This again did not show uh, promising results. And a Bossy et al. study, which looked at balanced binocular viewing, showed in par results with both uh, patching versus that of binocular therapy. The virtual reality headsets, again, did not show very promising results compared to a patching, though showed improvement comparatively. The other important study uh, to remember is a Birch et al. study, which again showed some amount of improvement, though the flag of it, again, is a level three in terms of not having a control study and not being randomized. So in essence, all these studies show that there is a definite improvement with dicoptic therapy, it's, though it is not in par with the patching. Again, there is a variability in terms of looking at these studies being used in terms of the number of duration of times which were given dicoptic therapy when it was assessed and the follow-up being very different in all these studies. Um, so effect on binocularity and stereopsis, though we looked at the binocular therapy, improving the binocularity first and the visual acuity later, there is no level one or level two evidence showing that there is a sens sensory status improvement in all of these studies. The limitations being um, in these studies where uh, the age of the child included, the compliance was different, the prior history of patching and the type of amblyopia study all uh, changed the way the results would be interpreted. And the follow-up again needs longer term follow-up in most of the studies to interpret it better. So the implications means that there is no significant correlation between the decreased suppression and improved visual function. There is a definite dissociation between the stereoacuity gain and the intraocular acuity difference. So the probability is the stereoacuity difference actual or otherwise needs to be proved. Can I um, remind Time is yeah, sure. sure, sure. The experimental drugs um, could be targeting on the excitatory or the inhibitory synapses. The important ones being transcranial direct uh, current stimulation or a magnetic stimulation. This has showed promising results in the adult uh, patients per se, but the uh, specificity of this to be delivered to the target circuits needs to be explored still. The environmental changes again in terms of uh, running showing a promising results when added to the patching or dark exposure or the exercise and visuomotor achievement. Should we look at assessing the outcomes in a better way rather than visual equity also needs to be explored. So our experience with respect to dicoptic therapy when we used it as a primary modality of treatment in anisometropic amblyopia, where it showed uh, where we included both from 8 to 40 years, only the anisometropic amblyo showed improvement in both distance and near visual equity. This is what we basically use in terms of uh, visual prime exercises, which is an indigenously developed uh, uh, therapy, which is basically based on monocular fixation and binocular field. Uh, this showed improvement in both contrast and the visual acuity. The three of the patients, in fact, gained stereopsis, which were not seen earlier. It showed improvement in both anisohypropic and anisomyopic growth. Uh, what challenges we had were uh, the COVID, because of the COVID, there were a lot of patients which are lost for follow-up. There was an unequal group of uh, patients which were enrolled between 8 to 18 and 18 to 40 to uh, deduce it based on the age. So where do we stand now? Uh, binocular therapy as an adjunct at a primary modality, we're not very sure. Optimal timing and time duration needs to be explored. Is it applicable to all types of amblyopia? What is the dose response relationship and the individual variability? What is the sustenance of visual acuity gain? Again, AO says there is no level one evidence to support binocular therapy as a uh, first line of management. It can be definitely used as an adjunct therapy to patch it. So I would conclude by saying, explore the numerous ways to get rid of laziness, either in the form of penalty, patch, or gaming. We are near, it's so far from saying, paradise lost and paradise regained. Thank you for listening. Sorry that I overshot uh, by a minute or two. It was an excellent presentation, Dr. Somya, and uh, absolutely wonderful collection of the entire research that has, uh, especially recently, that has been going on. And, and actually, these are very exciting times, I think, for uh, entire pediatric ophthalmology strabismus, which includes amblyopia therapy and vision therapy. So uh, there's so much to look forward to in a changing environment, which you have brought up very nicely. Thank you, sir. Yeah, really enjoyable presentation, I think. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, very nice uh, presentation, Soumya. Uh, just wa I wanted to ask you uh, something about uh, amblyopia therapy in adults. So that is something which is gaining uh, popularity, isn't it? 
So yeah. a lot of a uh, lot of softwares are coming up with uh, you know a promising uh, restoration of vision to amblyops who have uh, you know passed the age of uh, visual plasticity. So what is your experience in this regard? Uh, yeah, Nina. As I was mentioning in the talk, we had our DNB thesis uh, uh, on the same topic where we looked at using the binocular therapy as a primary modality. The patients basically had not experienced patching; they were just using glasses. Those patients were picked up with no history of patching, primarily from the age group of eight to forty. So, in that uh, group of forty patients that we study, nearly twenty-nine of them, or twenty-five uh, of them, were adults. That is above the age of eighteen. So we looked at uh, uh, all of them. That is, anis- primarily anisometropic, not having major strabismus per se. So what we saw was anisohypropic group improved a little better than anisomyopic group, though there was no statistical difference that we could find. And we also interestingly found that nine of them had a stereopsis improvement, of which uh, six of them gained stereopsis, which we couldn't record it at the beginning of the study. We also noticed that there was a change in the contrast. Uh, in all of the subjects that we uh, looked at, so that is what uh, we have as of now. We had given six weeks of therapy, and we had assessed them at the end of one month, at the end of three months. Uh, we are still following them up, but uh, we started the study just before COVID, and then the COVID started. So a lot of them have gone back, and uh, they're not able to come back, and things like that. So the long term follow up of them is a challenge as of now. But at the end of three months, whatever we could uh, see it. we are seeing an improvement so what we are doing at our institute as of now is to suggest them a therapy if they could do it in office or home therapy we are also looking at uh, using it as a home therapy primary modality and seeing does that make a difference i think uh, sir uh, would have more experience of uh, treating more children with that no i think you made a wonderful presentation and uh... some of the studies which you have quoted like ved murthy's one is especially on the adults dioptic therapy uh, in rp center also i think under dr rohit saxena there was a binocular vision uh, th- uh, study done uh, by uh, i think uh, so that was presented in apos in 2019 in which they had shown that the anisometropic amblyops uh, we can do the binocular vision therapy and the advantage compared to patching is that the stereopsis improves better in the binocular vision group compared to that but again the strabismic amblyops would not be feasible doing the binocular vision therapy so that's another uh, limitation of the binocular vision therapy we first need to align the eyes but in some platforms like the binox where there is a possibility of having a dioptic therapy even with the strabismics that is uh, possible we can do that same is true with some of the, uh, another study which is at the moment going on in rpc but which was stalled because of covid Uh, that is an rct in which we are using the binox and also one which is based on the oculus based vr games virtual reality games so i think that time will tell us i mean how much we, we that was it's been laid back by two years because of the covid sure sir i think the lot of studies the confusion comes with the group being included has everything like anisometropic strabismic sensory deprivation there is usually a mixed group and that is why the results become very difficult to assess with respect to one component that's why we thought we look at one of them in our study and see if it does make a difference right thank you samya so we move on to the next talk uh, if there are no any more any more questions in the chat box nia are there any questions in the chat box so that's more what you let's go on nina yeah So I think uh, I will invite uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma to deliver his talk on principles in squint surgery. Sir doesn't need any introduction. He's a join of strabismus and pediatric ophthalmology, and we've all learned from him again and again, year after year. We are learning still from him. Thank you, Nina, for that great introduction. And we are going to talk about the principles of strabismus surgery today. the times have changed i mean when we were students we were mostly focusing on strabismus surgery as a cosmetic procedure no more i think now we are saying that it is a binocular vision restoration surgery the goal post has changed because we can restore stereopsis and binocular vision so the goal for ophthalmologists is not just achieving 2020 or 6 by 3 vision with accommodation j1 vision but also restoring the stereopsis and that's why i would say that we should be now having our goals uh, changed 
but the important thing to understand in surgery is that we are going to talk about two things one is early and the other is alignment so there has to be an early alignment if we have to restore binocular vision to its fullest measures and as this case report of kenneth wright's own son who was picked up to have an esotropia at around 6 months of age given glasses and still has a esotropia so the squint surgery was done at 6 months of age so the stereopsis could be restored to almost normal level so this is a lesson for all of us the critical periods now we talk about is for congenital cataracts as we will have more about by dr rajesh sinha uh, around 6 weeks that we are talking of restoring for infantile esotropia 6 months is the time that we need to pick up these children and operate them by the first year and other conditions like intermittent exotropia nystagmus or refractive error we need to see that the alignment is restored by 6 years of age definitely if uh, the measurements can the management can be done by non surgical or surgical uh, dr S uh, satish had mentioned about the refraction and proper prescription and dr somya nicely covered the amblyopia therapy Uh, the surgical part we are now talking about, and uh, it's important that we are going to follow a path of OCIPE: observation, confirmation, inference, planning, and execution. And in this, I think Dr. Rohit has nicely covered how to examine the eyes. It is important that we follow these steps, missing out by a simple cover test and giving the proper glasses before we jump to surgery, which should be measured if. Uh, possible by prism bar cover test except for very small children in which we may have to depend on hirschberg's test and there was a question about the glasses uh, inducing prism so that has to be kept in mind especially for larger uh, adapters of power that we are dealing with and this will cause an induced prismatic effect as this diagram shows and you can have these tables which are available in rosenbaum's book as well as in kushner's where we can have the correction for the induced prismatic effect so we are going to have this uh, six extra ocular muscles in each eye 12 in the two eyes together which are disturbing the uh, problem in the nine houses that we have to deal with and we are going to correct them in a uh, measured way the torsion is the other perspective that we need to keep in mind we should look for the deviations in up and down gazes to look for any av patterns which may be missed and if there are av patterns look for inferior oblique overaction like this girl who had inferior oblique overactions and after the correction she has got the eyes corrected not only in up and down gazes but also the tertiary positions so the v exotropia with inferior oblique overaction you should look for and measure the deviations between up and down gazes and look for that inferior obliques are there or not not all cases of v exotropia will have inferior oblique overaction they may be having a true v but still there may not be any inferior oblique overaction so you should look for these 15 20% of cases which may be because of the displaced or dystopic lateral lectus pullis which cause the v pattern there may be asymmetry in the inferior oblique overaction similarly the a patterns may have superior oblique overactions that you should look for specifically but there might be cases uh, like in this azotropia there is a superior oblique overaction but this is an a isotropia without superior oblique overaction you can see that the superior limbs are at the same horizontal level and this is again because of the displaced pullis which is there an upward displacement of lr pullis causing an a pattern so for these the principle is that whenever there is an inferior oblique overaction along with the v pattern we would be tackling the obliques but if the obliques are not overacting then the horizontal muscle surgery is done with up or down shifting and the rule is medial lectus is shifted towards the apex of the v or a pattern and the lateral lectus towards the base the vertical shifting in principle shows you how the recession and resection both can be done with a shifting when we talk of the weakening procedures that we are we uh, may also have to see how much to do there are norms which are described the normative data but you may have to change it as per your surgical technique which may have a different amount of muscle stump that you leave behind the safe limits you have to keep in mind because an infant's eye would be much smaller and the effect the yield is much more so in an infant or a new 6 uh, month old child if you have to operate you would be having the upper limit set as about 5 or 5.5 mm only the same is true for the lateral rectus recessions so and then the measurement from the limbus would help you to Uh, take the proper measurements 
these surgical instruments are there which you will be taking there the incisions are several which have been described uh, recently there is a miss or minimally invasive strabismus uh, surgery incision by mojo but i would say that the best is the uh, for the beginners to start with the limbal incision and for uh, once you have little more comfort you can use the fornix incision you are uh, we prefer to sit on the sides of the uh, opposite side so that we can ob observe the muscle that we are operating very clearly now here the little rectus is being shown and see that uh, the globe has been anchored and now the little rectus is being hooked by the uh, gemisens hook now the conjunctiva is being uh, just displaced and while doing this you will see that the uh, hook moved towards the limbus which ensures that all the muscle width was in your hook and then you see the incising of the intramuscular septum which should be under direct visualization and see the pole this is known as a pole test you will see that and the full width of the muscle is seen now this is important so that you don't split the muscle the check ligaments and the intramuscular septum on either side are then dissected under view and 60 vicral suture is passed good imbrication should be done one in the center and then two uh, uh, bites are taken at the poles of the insertion and then the muscle can be disinserted you may have a little bit of bleeding at this point and you can give a light cautery while we are making the measurements of the uh, recession we should be seeing that this displacement which is occurring because of holding should not be the point where you are measuring so when you are holding in the center mark it from the poles of the insertion now here a 7.5 mm recession is being planned and we are marking it perpendicular to the insertion and the spatulated needles are neatly passed under view so that we do not have a perforation this is very important for myopic eyes in which the sclera is very thin so both these bites are 8 mm apart so that we have a width of the muscle ensured uh, after surgery and in small children you may have two separate bites and two separate knots to be passed so that the risk of losing the muscle is reduced and then finally the conjunctiva is closed with the 80 vicral suture for strengthening we have the plication which is a, a more recent technique instead of resection that we are going to talk about in this we are strengthening the muscle by uh, double breasting or tucking the uh, muscle now here the muscle medial rectus is being hooked the conjunctiva is uh, exposed and the muscle is exposed and you see that both the sides the intramuscular septum is incised at least 8 to 10 mm of separation should be made and then the muscle is marked 60 vicral sutures are passed at the two ends here there are two separate bites you can see because for strengthening a muscle the muscle is going to be taut so it's better that we have extra in our uh, imbrication in the muscle so that it doesn't slip there is just a simple technique in this uh, uh, compared to resection what you will see here if you have to do resection we would have disinserted the, the muscle here but here we are not disinserting the muscle and passing the uh, scleral bite and then back into the muscle separate now this is a muscle sclera muscle bite and iris repositor placed in between and the muscle is double folded on these sutures this will double fold the muscle strengthen the muscle and this is what is the reinforced plication that will give very good results as good as the resection without the risk of anti segment ischemia because we haven't changed the uh, disinserted the muscle adjustable suture technique is uh, something which we may make use of and in this what we would be planning is a little different is that we will be leaving a room for the muscle to be uh, advanced or recessed now here if you have planned these marks are made in the same way as i had shown earlier but these bites will now be passed radially the speculated needle is now being passed radially towards the limbus and leaving a room for an advancement so these bites are taken and then you will have a bucket handle suture in order to hold the globe at the time of adjustment and a one and a half knot technique is what i prefer for adjustment adjustment may be done 5 to 6 hours after the surgery if you have used no bupivacaine you have just used xylocaine 
or otherwise 24 hours after the surgery in adjustable times in the covid uh, times we have seen the mass of sliding news or a one and a half note news you can use either of these techniques the near and distance disparity may also be uh, noted in, in cases of squint some of them may have a conger convergence excess esotropia in which we use faden on the medial rectus and similarly if you have a uh, divergence excess then the combined resection and recession on the lateral rectus can be used to have more effect on the abduction or for distance just for the case uh, sake of the pgs remember the different inferences we can make from the measurements is by seeing the same measurements for distance and near different gazes paralytic versus restrictive up and down for whether which we are uh, fixing with the right eye or the left eye the primary or secondary that will tell us between a paralytic squint deviations between subjective and objective is very rarely done by most people but it should be done whenever you are in doubt of a retinal correspondence being abnormal so a harmonious arc you could pick up if you do these and finally we can measure with and without glasses which will tell us about accommodative squint uh, coming to the obliques we should avoid the inferior oblique myectomies or free tenotomies in today's age you can do inferior oblique recession or anterior positioning uh, this is just a brief video if there is time i would show otherwise i would skip the inferior oblique uh, we are again doing from the fornix approach the muscle lateral rectus is being hooked after this is done we can see the inferior oblique being hooked now this is in the for deep recess you will see the inferior oblique being lifted up and notice your attention with this uh, cursor here the white triangle this is important to see if you have got all the width of the inferior oblique if not you need to re hook the inferior oblique cut the intermuscular septum between the lr and inferior oblique pass the sutures after the disinsertion you don't have to pass sutures before disinsertion in inferior oblique it's much simpler the muscle never gets lost and then you can do a recession or anterior positioning as per your plan so this is a recession along the direction or you may do an anterior positioning which is usually done for dvds or you may do an anterior nasal transposition the stages procedure uh, mind you whenever we operate on the inferior obliques we may get a, a change in the extorsion the extorsion here is seen by the fovea being outlying the two lines horizontal lines and after the surgery will come and see that the fovea has come uh, in, in its right position this was the case in which we had the v pattern and which is corrected the superior obliques uh, there are several procedures you can just make a note mostly we are not recommending doing tenotomies free or tenectomies a z and l tenotomy may be done posterior tenectomy or tenotomy is a procedure which we do for mild cases of superior oblique overactions for more severe cases we may do a hang loose loop tenotomy or a silicon expander and for very severe cases a translational recession of superior oblique so these are the various procedures which you may see schematically shown in this diagram uh, this is of the ptso and this is a case in which superior oblique overaction has been corrected the translational recession is basically a recession but resuturing the superior oblique at the translatory point of the uh, globe which is 12 mm from the limbus and 6 mm nasal to the nasal border of superior rectus uh, i think time is short we cannot go into these details the strengthening procedure for superior oblique are the tucking and the modified harada ito for a uh, anterior uh, fibers being uh, tucked or uh, strengthened and uh, these are the schematic uh, diagram showing you the tucking procedure which may be done for cases in which there is a lax superior oblique and this is uh, showing you that i won't go into the transposition procedures which dr leela uh, will be talking about in paralytic strabismus but these are the newer techniques that we are talking about especially the modified nishida's procedure which is without disinsertion and splitting and so there is no risk of entry segment ischemia so these can correct these cases and we have to be careful of entry segment ischemia because the blood supply of three contiguous uh, recti muscles if uh, disinserted would be affecting the entry segment so these vessel sparing surgeries may be done uh, just i think i would uh, give a small word about nystagmus cases in which the yoke muscle surgery or augmented antecedent procedure can correct uh, 30 degrees of head turn 
by doing an augmented endosense recession means RMR 9 millimeters and lateral rectus 12 millimeter recession will correct a head posture of 30 degrees and would be uh, ideal thing to correct these people. So I would just say that we should be squint intellectuals, see the case individually and do the proper surgery to restore the alignment and time and so that we can restore binocular vision. Thank you all for the present listening. Thank you, sir, for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, you have elucidated all the uh, different types of strabismus surgery and uh, made it simple for us. It's a very big topic, very difficult to cover in the uh, you know short time that we have, but I think uh, you've touched upon all the salient points. I have uh, just one uh, small question, sir. So a lot of uh, children with, uh, I mean, of late, a few kids with ROP, uh, you know, uh, burnt out ROP, having eccentric fixation, uh, drag discs and phobia, they're coming to us asking for cosmetic improvement in the alignment. So obviously these kids are having uh, eccentric fixation. And uh, so how do we, can, is there any way by which we can improve their cosmetic appearance? They're not having a true squint because uh, there is a change in the direction of the, uh, uh, you know, that they have eccentric fixation. So is there any way? Tina, I think it's uh, really something which bothered us many uh, times because the parents would expect us to be correcting the squint. First is we should not fall into the trap. This is not a true squint. It is a pseudo strabismus because of a drag macula. And a simple thing which will guide you is you cover uh, the eye. The eye monocularly fixing also has the same position. Yes. So if you do a cover test, it will immediately tell you this is not a true squint. And then you look into the fundus, you'll see a drag macula. If that is so, you need to counsel the parents that this should not be corrected by a squint surgery. At the moment, I think retina surgeons are not in a position to correct. I think Gopal someday would do it. Uh, macular translocation surgery to uh, get the restoration of this uh, type of cases. So right now, I think this is not... Sorry. Sir, you are muted? No. I request everybody else to mute uh, so that uh, only the speaker is audible. I think this is not in the realm of the strabismus surgeon. Correction of these pseudo strabismus cases, if at all, someday we will have a macular translocation or restoration of the macula to its right position uh, by a retinal surgeon. Sir, can I ask one doubt, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, there are lots of cases in which there is an AMD which has damaged the central vision. They are all old people. Uh, you know, uh, so giving a prism. Uh, having them uh, the refocusing onto the paramacular area, can we actually improve the vision of these people? Uh, the problem is that if you give a prism, again, as long as their central fixation is there, they may fixate with the central position. That's the issue. So giving a prism will only change the, uh, uh, will induce a, a prismatic effect, but it will not deviate the rays to fall on the uh, paramacular or paraphobial area where you want to. That is the issue. So I think for these cases in Germany, I think there was, a, uh, it is not so common, but he was doing a macular translocation procedures, which was inducing a lot of uh, torsion and th almost like 30 degrees of torsion for which the strabismus surgery was being done by using the oblique muscles, all the four oblique muscles to restore the torsion. But he, he I'm forgetting his name, I think from Germany. He was doing this macular translocation procedures for the ARMD. Yeah, but that surgery is now not being done, sir. It's not being done now. That is pre-injection era. Prisms actually is only changing at the outset, and the eye would try to refixate from the fovea. Thank you, sir. The low vision uh, aids are a challenge in patients of AMD because they have that very disturbing central scotoma. So. Uh, even when we have been trying in many of these patients in low vision uh, clinic, it's it's a challenge. They have to learn to read. And in fact, the basic workup is to magnify the perimacular area and they have to learn to concentrate on the image that is adjacent to that central scotoma and not the central scotoma. So it's a cumbersome process for them. And I mean, usually they can uh, be comfortable enough to read headlines and all of the newspaper. But yes, it's a... AMD rehabilitation 
uh, is a challenge. If I remember right, the uh, the surgeon who was doing the macular translocation, his spouse was a squint surgeon. So he used to do the translocation and his wife used to do the squint surgery. All in all. <laughs> Nina, let's move on. Yes, I think uh, so from this, we move on to paralytic strabismus and I invite uh, Dr. Laila Mohan to talk about managing paralytic strabismus, especially the surgical part. I will just uh, share my screen to introduce Madam. Uh, Madam doesn't need any introduction. She's a very familiar figure in uh, our uh, regional and national ophthalmology circuits. Uh, she's currently the director at Comptrust Academy of Research and Training and Comptrust Eye Hospital, Calicut. Uh, she has done her undergraduate and postgraduate training from Godwin Medical College, Calicut, uh, where she was a gold medal winner in ophthalmology. She has done her fellowship in anterior segment microsurgery from Arvindai Hospital, Madurai, and subsequently FACO training from Rajan Eye Care, Chennai. She had the good fortune to do observership in pediatric cataract under Dr. Edward Wilson, uh, South Carolina, and with Dr. Vasavada at uh, Rekhudi Bai Hospital, and also in some pediatric glaucoma training under Dr. Anil Mandal at FBPI. Uh, she worked uh, briefly in uh, Saudi Arabia from 87 to 1995, and uh, She's currently in Comptrist Eye Hospital. She has won many awards, including the Best Doctor Award from IMA Code in 2016 and the Sita Lakshmi Award for Corneal Transplantation in 2010. She is a true pan of thalmologist, and uh, I invite you, Madam, to deliver your talk. Thank you, Dr. Nina, for that <laughs> great introduction. And thank you, Dr. Gopal and uh, Dr. Sotarohit for giving me this opportunity. I feel embarrassed to talk after Dr. Pratip Sharma. <laughs> I'm still learning from him. And uh, shall I share my screen? I couldn't. Yes, ma'am, please. Uh, I'll stop sharing. You can share. Can you see now? Yes, yes. So the topic is uh, management of paralytic strabismus. Sorry. So, uh, so paralytic strabismus may be supranuclear, nuclear, internuclear, fascicular, neuromuscular, or muscular uh, causes may be there. And a thorough evaluation as to the cause of the paralysis, imaging, and neuroconsultation, if necessary, should be done. And the Indian study uh, has shown that ischemia as the cause of 60% uh, of the acquired paralytic strabismus by Swati et al. from All India Institute. Any oculomotor paralysis involving more than one muscle or a variable presentation, myasthenia should be kept in mind during investigation. And some of the congenital cranial disintegration syndromes present with paralysis as well as restriction. And uh, from Von Oden's book, when we read uh, superior oblique palsy as the most common paralytic strabismus, uh, I was not so well convinced at that time, but at least in children, definitely it is. And a high index of suspicion should be there for abnormal head posture, the telltale facial asymmetry, which can be abolished if corrected early enough and may present in adulthood superior oblique palsy We'll go through the three uh, nerve palsy, superior oblique palsy being the most common. Uh, I'll uh, talk about it first. And even in adulthood, it is seen as a decompensation of this uh, sub, uh, congenital uh, superior oblique palsy. So the dictum that every case of vertical strabismus is a superior oblique palsy, unless proved otherwise. Uh, and superior oblique palsy is congenital unless proved otherwise. And if not congenital, it is traumatic. And if not congenital or traumatic, it is it may be neurological. So an isolated superior oblique palsy need not uh, have a, uh, uh, exhaustive uh, imaging and evaluation. So congenital, coming to the congenital uh, superior oblique palsy, the facial asymmetry and head posture is there in 80% of the 70 to 80% of the cases as we have seen. And mid facial hypoplasia on the dependent side can be measured with the, uh, on either side by measuring both sides from angle of the mouth to the canthus, lateral canthus. And this, as you see, this child after one year after surgery, the head posture has completely been abolished and even the facial asymmetry has disappeared. They have large vertical fusional amplitude and uh, thus maintaining binocularity for quite a long time. 
and the parks three step test uh, evaluation should be done after correction of the head posture you can see hypertrophia becomes manifest only after correction of the head posture and uh, the belchowski's test should be done by head tilt test and the surgical strategy depends upon naps classification shows only where the hypertrophia is maximum and uh, for um, uh, forced duction test for superior rectus contracture for in long standing cases should be done on table and in a, a, a superior oblique tendon laxity test uh, by superior oblique traction test should be done on table and depending upon which eye is fixing you may change the strategy so coming to the surgical strategy inferior oblique recession inferior oblique overaction is a commonest presentation showing a maximum hypertrophia in the uh, opposite up gaze that is the uh, naps class 1 and uh, uh, just as in inferior oblique recession may be all that is necessary for uh, superior oblique palsy which corrects in 80% of the cases but if it is large more than 20% then you may have to do a, a graded anteriorization and early surgery as you see immediately after surgery the facial the head posture has changed and at this point uh, plagio cephaly can present also as a superior oblique underaction so which needs similar Uh, surgical strategy superior oblique tendon tuck should be done when there is a tendon laxity as seen by superior oblique traction test this girl presented with the diplopia as dr rohit has come, uh, rightly pointed out uh, subtle superior oblique palsy may just present with a uh, eye strain while reading so here we have done a tuck and you should be careful that iatrogenic browns is a problem and after surgery you have to uh, look for uh, tightness of the superior superior oblique and this is a decompensated congenital superior oblique palsy who presented much later saying that it is recently getting worse and uh, this is naps 4 where the hypertrophia is more or less equal in all the opposite gaze and the uh, depression and a large hypertrophia in primary gaze position she had a lax tendon and fdt was positive for superior rectus and so we did an inferior oblique recession, uh, recession. superior oblique tuck and superior rectus uh, recession uh, in the same eye producing a complete alignment and coming to the traumatic superior oblique palsy which presents very subtle strabismus uh, subtle uh, subtle chin down posture maybe all that is there and belchowski shows a very small hypertrophia and maddox rod test shows uh, you may have to rule out a bilaterality which shows maddox rod uh, shows a torsion of more than 10 degree and the large uh, fundus extorsion so in these cases this uh, young man a carpenter uh, who was not working uh, doing carpentry for the past 5 years after an rta uh, had torsional diplopia and after heredito procedure which strengthens the anterior one third of the uh, superior rectus which is the which subserves torsional fibers he was completely relieved so uh, coming to six nerve palsy it is the commonest acquired paralytic strabismus seen in all age groups as shown by swati et al in the indian study 43% as shown uh, by them and commonest cause is microvascular with a recovery almost in 70% of the cases and traumatic six nerve palsy often show poor recovery and congenital six nerve palsy is rare so an isolated unilateral abduction deficit in has to be considered as drs duens unless proven otherwise and acquired cases should be fully investigated for the other associations and cause and any six nerve palsy during childhood should better to do imaging we have seen many cases uh, coming with a positive result in imaging so this is a congenital six nerve palsy the child uh, uh, had a marked face turn to left and abduction deficit and after repeated examination to rule out a drs he uh, diagnosed as a six nerve palsy sorry and uh, uh, instituted patching and of the right eye uh, which prevents contracts from medial rectus and prevent amblyopia as well and after neuro evaluation a recess resection was done and plication may be done as dr pradeep sharma sir has already pointed out in acquired cases sixth nerve palsy um, acute phase patching should be done to prevent contracture of medial rectus and avoid diplopia botox to the medial rectus for the time for a temporary time follow up should be done every 6 weeks if the angle is stable after 6 months decide surgery and if adduction is better than minus 4 then a large recess resection can be can work 
and if it is worse then you have to do a force duction test if it is tight then a force generation should be looked for any action of the medial rectus if it is not there go ahead with transposition procedures if a force generation test shows that there is some uh, action in the medial rectus uh, in the some action in the medial uh, lateral rectus then uh, recess resection will work so vertical transposition procedures there are it utilizes vertical muscles to um, achieve diplopia free field of binocular single vision and disinsertion and transposition interferes with ciliary circulation as already pointed out by pradeep sharma sir and transposition um, anterior segment ischemia should be kept in mind so it can be either full tendon transposition or partial tendon where there are variety of partial tendon transpositions all in order to uh, prevent anterior segment ischemia and vertical rectus can um, both superior and inferior rectus can be transposed or the single muscle superior rectus transposition works very well unless there is a large hypertrophia when inferior rectus alone can be also done and uh, these are the different uh, procedures and augmentation by either resection along with the transposition or by suturing the muscles uh, to the sclera or the muscles can be done and crossword technique as shown by Uh, pradeep sharma sir which can be combined with the medial rectus botox if there is a full tendon transposition or the session if uh, partial tendon transposition is done to save uh, from uh, ischemia anterior segment ischemia modified nishidas is becoming more popular because it is no split no need tenotomy procedure and there is less chance of anterior segment ischemia and scleral suture can be released if you want later and along with the medial rectus recession it gives correction of almost 45 to 50 prisms and this young um, boy had a rta engineering student uh, after a very long time in wheelchair he had a uh, nishidas procedure which gave some amount of uh, a movement as well so the uh, nishidas procedure i i think i will just skip the um, uh, you uh, transpose the lateral aspect lateral uh, um, half of the superior and inferior rectus muscles to uh, the lateral uh, upper border of the lateral rectus about 12 mm behind the limbus that's what we do and uh, coming to third nerve palsy management is a challenging because multi of the multiple muscles involved and it may be partial or complete and pupil sparing palsy is vasculopathic mostly in 70% which may recover uh, and follow up for progression of pupil involvement should be done if you are not imaging because uh, of these vasculopathic uh, issues pupil involving third nerve palsy is an emergency need immediate imaging and aberrant regeneration also is uh, usually due to a mass lesion by a neurosome trauma or tumor and congenital cases aberrant regeneration and pupil involvement are not uncommon and they need imaging amblyopia management is important unlike fourth nerve palsy where abnormal head posture retains binocularity for a long time and ophthalmoplegic migraine can be cyclically recurring uh, uh, not cyclic but uh, recurring paralysis can be seen and look for fourth nerve involvement when there is a third nerve paralysis uh, so uh, surgical challenge depends upon the muscles affected a uh, force generation and force duction test should be done to plan surgery and if there is any movement uh, the uh, muscles can be utilized for a recess resection and uh, on ocular movements if there is better than um, uh, midline the eyes are coming and the eyes medially coming to um, better than minus 4 then uh, recess resection may be effective a force generation test if it is not inducing any uh, uh, action in medial rectus then a large uh, then a transposition procedure has to be done a uh, force generation test if it is negative you should look for contracture of the lateral rectus to decide whether you should do a large supramaximal lateral rectus resection along with or the periosteal fixation to lateral orbital wall before proceeding for medial anchory and if it is negative then a wise splitting of lateral rectus to medial rectus transposition can be effective already uh, um, uh, how these uh, tests are done was shown by dr rohit 
periosteal anchoring was done in this boy who already had a large resource resection 15 years ago and still had a recurrence of the exotropia. And if, uh, as already pointed out, you have to do a large lateral rectus recession or periosteal fixation before uh, periosteal anchoring, which can be done either pre carincular or skin root. So uh, when there is an aberrant regeneration, there is some amount of movement, but to improve ptosis, we can utilize the fixation du durus and recess resection in the contralateral eye, which may not be easy to convince sometimes is a better choice to improve ptosis. And medial transposition when lateral rectus is not tight uh, can be done. Dissection should be as far back as more than 15 millimeters and if it is tight, it's very difficult to get it nasally. And augmentation with the equatorial sutures, as shown by Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir, has shown good results. But it has some complications. It produces ab Ma abnormal movements and Ma choroidal effusions. Ma Ma a gentle Sorry. reminder. Yes. So uh, the take-home messages are: it has to be fully investigated. Acquired paralysis should be given time for recovery and thorough evaluation to assess the muscles involved. And uh, all these tests should be done before planning surgery and goal is to achieve alignment in primary position. And the realistic expectation should be counseled with the patient well before the surgery. Thank you, I'm sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you have uh, quickly covered all the uh, important uh, uh, paralytics, quints, and in, shown us very nice videos of uh, the procedures in such a short time. Uh, I think that was quite commendable. So I have a doubt, ma'am. Uh, you said about uh, the fourth nerve palsy. A lot of children we have uh, uh, with frontal plagiocephaly coming to us with uh, uh, with uh, apparent superior oblique palsy. So they'll be having one-sided uh, a plagiocephaly and uh, they will it will look like a superior oblique palsy with inferior oblique overaction and there will be a hypertropia head tilt and all that so if they come way, uh, so you said in your uh, uh, in your uh, uh, presentation that uh, you know doing the surgery corrects the head tilt that's true but these children often have very marked facial asymmetry also like uh, so uh, in uh, recently i read somewhere that if you send these children at very young age uh, to the neurosurgeon, uh, correcting the craniosynostosis makes a big difference on the uh, orbital alignment also. So do you have any experience, any of the panelists, uh, do you have any experience in this? Uh, it is true that um, uh, the first thing to do in infancy is to mold the head to in such a uh, uh, way that the uh, frontal uh, retrusion which is the reason for the superior oblique underaction can be corrected. But often they don't go to the neurosurgeon at that, uh, at that age or not many people do that in India because I have tried, when I have had some very young children, I have tried even in um, uh, the Nimhans uh, Bangalore, I have tried to send them over uh, to do a neurosurgical procedure. But often they come to us and the ocular plagiocephaly, that is uh, due to the superior oblique underaction, there is some amount of uh, uh, plagiocephaly, uh, I mean, uh, the facial asymmetry produced due to that also. That I think can be corrected, uh, not to the full extent, of course, but I have a series of uh, children who have had quite early and uh, they have, uh, uh, definitely they have improved in their facial asymmetry to some extent. Sir, uh, Pradeep Sharma sir would be the uh, best person to comment on that. No, I think that's right. That If we can do the uh, cranius dysostosis surgery, uh, maybe by the plastic surgeons, many of the neurosurgeons may or may not have the time in India. Actually, we are all having short of times that we do more drastic procedures or to save life rather than doing such uh, procedures. But if, yes, they can be uh, tackled early, we would be able to uh, prevent not only this plagiocephaly, but many other cranial dysostosis. Uh, regarding what ma'am was saying, the facial asymmetry, if you correct the superior oblique palsy early, then this facial uh, asymmetry doesn't occur or gets uh, resolved. It's mostly because of a asymmetric head posture, which is happening. Correct. Uh, Tina, if I can make a point. Uh, 
there is actually a, one of my best friend's child had uh, plagiocephaly. So she sent the pictures very early in life. So we had referred it to a craniofacial surgeon in Bangalore, and Dr. Derek. So the child was operated, frontorbital advancement was done. The child looks much better now. Uh, though I have not still done a squint surgery, the child needs a squint surgery. The child also had a cross amblyopia, so patched and then now the vision is all better. The child is now four and a half years old. So it does make a difference. I mean, since you asked an experience, that was my best friend's child. So that's how we picked it up and we sent it across. So that's, that's that nice. is just that I wanted to add that. Yeah, because I also had a similar experience. I had sent one kid to Dr. Suhas at Ames and he, he actually operated on the kid. And that's why the whole idea, I was thinking that probably uh, if you pick them up early, you know, uh, the orbital, uh, the, uh, the skull surgery would make, uh, definitely give a greater cosmetic appearance as far as the uh, facial asymmetry is concerned. And probably then you can go ahead with the screen surgery as ma'am said. So I think the awareness is required. It be done before 18 months, I think. Yes, yes. Once yeah. they're two years old, it cannot be done. So most of the time, the kids come to us by that time only. We get referred some patients who have been operated for their craniosynostosis and uh, subsequently they develop squint or because of the malpositioning of the orbit. But they all, of course, do have a varying amount of strabismus and I'm not sure, uh, you know, how much it would have made a difference. So, uh, yes, it's, it's, I think, something where, you know, team effort is still evolving before we can come to better results. Thank you. I think uh, we will move on to the uh, next talk. And we are from Strabismus. We are going to move on to Pediatric Cataract, which is a totally different ball game. And uh, I invite uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha to talk about the basic steps in Pediatric Cataract Surgery. I'll just uh, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, are my slides visible? Yeah, but I think Dr. Dina, Dr. Dina, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I'll just share it again. So I just uh, share my screen again. You need to advance it. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, I think uh, now it's visible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Rajesh Sinha. He's uh, currently the Professor of Ophthalmology, uh, Cornea, Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at RP Center Ames. Uh, he has uh, about 325 publications in various journals, 128 in index journals, 77 chapters in various textbooks. Uh, authored three textbooks and four educational books and manuals. He's currently the Editor-in-Chief of Kerosite, past Editor-in-Chief of Daily Journal of Ophthalmology and DOS Times, member of the Editorial Board of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. He's a lead guest editor for a special issue of Journal of Ophthalmology, which is an indexed international journal. He has conducted many instruction courses at AAO, AIOC, ESCRS, APAO, and APACRS. He has been involved in, in, uh, as an investigator in three international multicentric FDA trials and many national trials. He's a reviewer in 10 international journals and is currently the honorary treasurer of AIOS. So we welcome you, uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, to this webinar, and I request you to share your screen. Thank you, Dr. Nina, for the kind words. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gopal Pillai for organizing such a wonderful meeting uh, along with Dr. Sai Kumar and of course, uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena for including me in this session. So thanks coaching of Tamil club and thank, uh, of course, Gopal is a dear friend. So, uh, you know, he likes to keep me in his uh, meetings. So I'm really thankful for that. Uh, I'll be talking about pediatric cataract surgery. There are various things related to pediatric cataract surgery. Like uh, it can be a, congenital cataract that has happened because of so many factors. There can be various factors related to cataract formation. There can be traumatic cataract that also because in children, the you know trauma is also quite high and traumatic cataract is also seen very often. You can get sort, very, various sorts of congenital anomalies in, uh, in, in these uh, children, along with you know, lenticular anomalies like PHPV or microsphere of AK, et cetera. So all these things can be there 
but i will just be focusing on a routine congenital cataract the basic steps related to cataract and what are the issues related to the uh, routine pediatric cataract surgery now as you can see here you know when we talk about cataract then uh, uh, the first thing that comes to mind that you know you have to think about the nucleotomy and you have to think about all those things uh, you know various steps which may cause problems and pcrs etc but in a pediatric cataract nucleotomy and all these things is not an issue you know you can aspirate the nucleus the cortical fibers very easily but there are other issues other issues in relation to the capsule now the 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 capsule is quite elastic so performing a good capsular excess is a challenge both anterior and posterior now maintaining the transparency of capsule is another big challenge because you do a cataract surgery very nice surgery but later on there can be cells in the posterior capsule and that can lead to you know posterior capsular opacification you can have fibrotic kind of uh, uh, pcos wherein you see such uh, you know fibrotic uh, uh, capsules wherein um, you cannot manage even in a older child wherein somebody has tried a yag in this but it's it doesn't help because it is very thick and many times what happens is that even the anterior capsule if you have done a small capsular excess there is a risk of phimosis and then it gets stuck to the lens and all sorts of uh, uh, problems related to the capsule is there so so as you can see here what happens is that if the capsulotomy or capsular excess is not very good not uniformly covering the optic edge in that case if there is fibrosis of capsule it pushes the lens there is zipping effect and then the lens comes up and then the iris goes behind cause a synecdoche with capsule there is optic capture so all sorts of things can happen so so what i what i meant was that in a pediatric cataract it is the capsule that is uh, that is something over which we have to really pay a lot of attention in both anterior capsule as well as posterior capsule so what and how to handle this so i'll just show you a video clip by uh, you know uh, showing all the routine steps now as you can see here the glow is not there because of the central cataract so uh, it's better to dilate the pupil with intracameral adrenaline and then stain the capsule once you have stained it remove the extra trapen blue and then inject high viscosity viscoelastic and then start with a capsulotomy with a needle you once you create an uh, a flap with a needle hold it with the forceps because the capsule has a tendency to go to the periphery so your force should come centripetally the force should be centripetal so that you get a nice circular excess and once you have a good excess you do a good hydro procedure so that you can separate the cortical uh, nuclear element and then aspiration as i said is not such a big issue in case of pediatric cataract once you have a good capsular excess you hold it hold the cortical fibers pull towards the center just follow the same principle as in any other cataract for removing the cortical fibers so hold it pull it towards the center bring it and then aspirate it so that's how you have you can complete the cortical aspiration and have a clear uh, uh, bag but here what happens in sometimes pediatric cataract that little bit of strand cortical strands these can proliferate so as you can see here i'm just trying to use by manual go into the extreme periphery of equator and trying to remove all that and then a posterior capsulotomy as i said that posterior capsular opacification is very high in these cases so we should perform a central circular posterior capsular excess and then anterior vitrectomy why because you remove the capsule so that it doesn't opacify and then you do a little bit of anterior vitrectomy so that the scaffold of vitreous is also gone so so that is why that is how the even if uh, some cortical fiber proliferates it doesn't come in the center and as the initial uh, surgery was performed with a 2.2 ml incision and you have done an anterior vitrectomy so it's always better to introduce your cartridge into the anterior chamber so you enlarge the size to 2.4 2.5 and then introduce the lens into the bag now suture is essential in such cases 
And as, as, as I, uh, you can see here that if you do a, a nice circular posterior capsular rexis with a forceps, then when you ca have caused a tearing effect, it doesn't extend even if you manipulate the lens inside. And here I'm going behind the lens because some of the viscoelastic goes into this opening wherein you have done the initial vitrectomy. So you have to remove that viscoelastic as well and then place the lens back into the bag. Nice covering of the anterior capsular, capsular axis over the IOL margin and a central posterior capsular axis maintains the clarity of the, uh, of the uh, visual axis. That is very essential. So this is the basic step that we normally follow. Now, if we are, we are not planning to put an IOL, then you can, uh, you know, sometimes what happens is that people may not uh, be able to uh, handle posterior capsule very well with the forceps, etc. You can cut with a vitrector as well. If you are not implanting a lens, suppose a four-month, five-month-old child, you are doing a cataract surgery, you are not implanting the lens, you can do a posterior capsulotomy with the help of a vitrector as well. But if you are implanting a lens, we should avoid using vitrector because if there is any manipulation, there is risk of extension because the margin cut by the vitrector is, it's not, it's not a tearing effect. It, you have cut it with the vitrector. So whenever there's a force that goes there, it doesn't stretch. It, uh, and when it stretches, it extends. So, so in a case wherein you want to keep the child AFA kick, you can go ahead and uh, uh, perform uh, with the vitrector. Now, Sometimes, even in a child, now a posterior capsulotomy or capsular axis is done up to the age of eight years, but this is an 11 year old child, but had a posterior polar cataract, the posterior capsule is also pacified. So in such a case, again, you have to do a posterior capsular axis. You can do a nice posterior capsular axis. You, in such cases, you may or may not do an anterior vitrectomy. If you get to see some, as there are some fibrillar material here in the center, then it is advisable to do an anterior vitrectomy because you would like to remove this, this material so as to clear the visual axis. So once you have done a posterior capsular axis, you can do an anterior vitrectomy. You can do a, 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 a small central uh, posterior capsular axis of the size of a pupil, something about three to four millimeters, not more than that because an 11 year old child will not have much of a problem. And then you can implant the IOL in the bag nicely, inject viscoelastic, create a nice bag, and then put uh, the IOL in the capsular bag. And as uh, uh, I said that if you do a manual tearing effect of the posterior capsular, capsular excess, does not cause any extension, even if you manipulate when you have put the IOL in the bag. Once again, anterior capsular, capsular excess covering the IOL optic margin nicely all around. It is very essential because whatever you do, there is some risk of fibrosis that can happen in children. So if there is any fibrosis, if this margin is well covered, then the force will be equal all around. So the IOL will not get decentered. That is the biggest advantage. Uh, there are a couple of studies that I'm showing. There are more studies in the literature and it states that posterior capsular axis and anterior vitrectomy is very essential for maintaining the clarity of uh, the visual axis in the pediatric cataract. And less than two years with posterior capsular, capsular axis and anterior vitrectomy, even in those cases, 10% of visual axis of pacification has been noted. So even after doing all these, you can still have. So that is why you have to be prepared for everything. Then again, if the child is more than two years, no PCC, then uh, of course the PCO rate is very high. Some studies have shown 100%, some this study has shown 83%. The more than two years with only PCC, no anterior vitrectomy, then 35% VAOA was noted. Why? Because you have done a PCC, but still there is a scaffold of anterior vitreous phase over which the cortical fibers, they grow, they, uh, they move, they migrate. So that is why the risk of VAO is high. So overall, PCO rate in less than eight years of age is very high. Now, whatever you do, as I said, you can still have posterior capsular pacification. So if you have such a case wherein the lens is in the bag, but you can see so much of fibrosis. So with the help of a Sinsky, a blunt instrument, you can just separate the capsule, a capsular adhesion with the IOL, go behind the lens, 
then inject some viscoelastic to create a space. Inject some viscoelastic to create a space and then make a posterior capsular opening. And uh, once you have created a posterior capsular opening, you can use a vitrector and clear the visual axis. Now, most of the anterior segment surgeons are very, uh, you know, comfortable doing it from the anterior root. But one can do it from the posterior root or one can also do with a hybrid root. Now, once you have cleared the visual axis, you can just push the eye well behind the, this capsule, anterior capsule and it stays rock solid in its position. Now, if you are a little bit comfortable in the posterior root, then you can also use a hybrid approach. You can put a, a AC maintainer in the anterior chamber and you can go through the pars plana and clear the visual axis with the help of a, a vitrector. A, a, a full-fledged uh, you know, posterior segment surgeon will definitely go through the posterior route. But the basic idea is that uh, I, I would not like to hydrate the vitreous too much. So, so the AC maintainer is kept anteriorly. Whatever cutting and removal is being done, a little bit of fluid goes posteriorly, seeps through this uh, these areas and maintains the chamber. And then you put a... Now, now, I'm putting a suture here because in this case, I've used a 20-gauge vitrector. Even with a 23-gauge vitrector, you have to check in, in children whether it is the eye is hypotenuse or the pressure is well built up. If there is any doubt, put a suture. This is a rule of pediatric cataract surgery. And the last thing that I would like to show here is that, you know, in an effect, sometimes what happens when you have to put a secondary eye well, you see that the, both the anterior and posterior capsule merges. I mean, it merges, what happens that the that there is a proliferation of uh, cortical fibers all around like a tire. Now, the central visual axis is clear. You can just put that is general the eye well in the sulcus. But if you put the eye well in the sulcus, what will happen that because of the uh, you know circular ring of cortical fibers, the haptic will be raised a little bit and with the movement of the pupil, the iris, it will cause pigment dispersion. So it is advisable to remove this, remove this tire of, uh, you know, the somering ring, and then put a, a multi-piece eye well in the sulcus. And once you have done it in the sulcus, if it is possible, one should try to do a posterior optic capture. It really helps because it prevents further proliferation of uh, yeah, the cortical fibers in the visual axis. So. Uh, optic capture maintains the lens not only in the center, but it also uh, prevents further migration of the lens fibers in the center of the visual axis. So these are some of the scenarios that I wanted to present, and there are many more things in pediatric cataract surgery, but these are certain basic things which do uh, we do encounter in our day-to-day -day practice when we are handling a routine pediatric cataract, a routine congenital cataract, a developmental cataract, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, uh, for the excellent videos and uh, very lucid talk, uh, touching upon the very important steps of pediatric cataract surgery. So there is one question uh, from a, a postgraduate uh, who wants to know that why is there increased inflammation in pediatric cataract surgery and uh, how is your postoperative management different? See, uh, in any pediatric eye, young age, in, uh, increased healing response and increased inflammation. That is known for everything, whether it's a pediatric cataract surgery or it's a pediatric keratoplasty or uh, in pedi pediatric keratoplasty, the risk of rejection is high. So because of the high increased healing response, the inflammatory reaction and all these things are high in pediatric cataract. So what we have to be careful is that you know, even a little bit of cortical fiber left, as, as I was showing that, you know, once you have cortical cleanup, we should also try to see that if there are cortical fibers attached to the capsule, sometimes some cells, one should try to, you know, rub with the help of a bimanual or with the help of coaxial, whatever, so that you remove the cortical fibers completely, polish the capsule completely. Not a, In the center, you can still do a capsular excess, but even in the periphery, was what I wanted to show in the first video, there were there were few strands that were there. So that is the first thing that one should do, a complete cortical cleanup. Point number two, one should try to uh, dilate the pupil very nicely in these cases because if you touch the iris, 
uh, while manipulating, then the risk of inflammation in the post-op period is very high. Then, uh, uh, of course, the post-op treatment is very essential. The initial first week, the topical steroid is uh, given in a, with a higher frequency, something about you know, six times a day. And then, of course, you taper it off. So, uh, I mean, this is the thing. And, and if we have done all the procedures nicely without doing too much of iris manipulation, without do, uh, you know, leaving any fibril, any cortical fiber, doing all nice cleanup, doing a nice vitrectomy, no vitreous coming into a DH chamber or anywhere, then the risk of inflammation is quite, significant, quite low. And that is why these days the results of pediatric cataract surgery have improved quite a lot because of good instrumentation, good understanding, good quality post-op treatment. So all these things are essential. Thank you. Can I ask a question, Nina? Yeah, yes, sir, sure. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ajesh, nice, nice videos, uh, nice, nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, I think this uh, uh, the anterior vitrectomy also goes a very long way in preventing inflammation. It is very Absolutely. evident that you know the eyes which have undergone vitrectomy versus, versus the eyes which have undergone just a posterior CCC, there is a definite difference in inflammation. And one more thing, uh, the the general trend is that eight years and beyond, we we all say that you know you just handle it just like a, an, an adult cataract. Is that is that what you also follow, or is, is anything absolutely different? up to eight years? We we do posterior capsulotomy, posterior capsular excess, and beyond that we don't do it. That uh, but but what we do is that we try to you know polish the posterior capsule, the anterior surface of the posterior capsule well, so that and we try with the help of a bimanual we can go you know even you know in the periphery and try to polish it so that there is no cortical fibers left. We don't do any posterior capsular excess after because even if there is a mild PCO that can still happen, then that can be handled by a yak capsulotomy. You don't get that kind of a thick PCO in such cases, in, in almost most of the cases. I mean, exceptions can be there, but in most of the cases, you don't get th such thick PCOs in uh, children more than eight years. Uh, one more question, uh, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, so, like when, when you have infants in whom, uh, you know, you've done cataract surgery at, let's say, at a very young age, you know, two years and all, for a, and we have done a good PCC and the visual axis remains clear. But let's say after many years, uh, you know, three, four years, sometimes we see this uh, ring of somering and sometimes you see a tinge of cortex, uh, you know, just coming into the visual axis from the periphery. It's not there, but it's just hanging there. So what do you do for these patients? Uh, do you recommend going ahead and washing it? or? Uh, uh, yes. uh, I, would, I would just add one more thing to it uh, while uh, talking about it. If there is any cortical fiber coming in the visual axis, this means that it is proliferating, it is coming, and there is a gap between the capsule and the lens. And that is why it is coming. So it is very essential that you know if you leave it, more will come. So it is very essential to go once again behind the lens, polish, rub it, remove all the cortical fibers. That is one. Point number two, sometimes, uh, one more thing I would like to add here is that sometimes there is a tendency that in a five year or six year of age, wherein you can still do a yak capsulotomy. So people try to do yak capsulotomy and don't do a membranectomy in such cases because obviously, you know, removing, going, uh, as Dr. Sai was also telling that, you know, the risk of uh, CME also is there, the risk of inflammation is there, all these things. But what we have found out in our series of patients that in such cases, because the vitreous is nice gel-like, what happens that even if you cut the capsule, if it is, there are two types of, uh, you know, uh, uh, PCOs. One wherein if you cut it, if you just put a yak, it's very thin, it stretches. If it stretches, then you can manage it with the yak capsulotomy. But if you have to cut it, then in that case, it remains suspended in the visual axis. We have a series of about 12 such eyes, which we had, uh, you know, uh, we had, uh, we have documented all that. So in such cases, what happens that when you, you can cut with the yak, the child is cooperative, but still it remains suspended in the visual axis. And that causes a lot of problems to the children. In such cases, we advocate uh, performing a, a membranectomy. So
Thank you. Okay, Rajesh, for want of time, let's uh, go to the next talk. Thank you very much. You uh, Arun, uh, 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 Nina, Nina is the next speaker, right? Yeah, can I share yeah. my screen? Yes, yes. Dr. Nina is senior consultant uh, in uh, Giridhar Eye Hospital, Cochin. She'll be talking on managing childhood myopia. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. So moving on from pediatric cataract to myopia. So managing childhood myopia. So what is myopia? We all know it's a condition in which the light from the distant objects does not focus on the retina, but instead focuses in front of the retina. So we know that myopia often produces a lot of symptoms and parents or children come to us with all sorts of these kinds of symptoms. So why is so much hype about myopia now? The hype is because myopia is a booming epidemic now. It's a major cause of visual impairment, not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world. And day by day, the prevalence of myopia is increasing. It's as high as 70 to 90% in some of the East Asian countries. And as per the North India myopia study by Rohit Saxena et al., the prevalence of myopia in school-going children in urban India was even more than 13.1%. And not just that, it's an economic burden if you consider the cost of maintaining myopia and its treatment modalities. So what about pediatric myopia? It's also becoming a global pandemic. So there is a rapid increase in prevalence of childhood myopia in Asian countries. And the progression rate of myopia in East Asian children is as high as minus one diopters every year. And it's thought that by 20 by 50, half of the global population, that's a whooping 5 billion people are going to be myopic. And one fifth of this, that is about 1 billion are going to be high myopic. So that explains the global burden of myopia we are going to face. So to understand about myopia, we should, and to understand about the management strategies, we should know what causes myopia. So there are definitely genetic factors, environmental factors, and other factors like prematurity and low birth weight. But considering the genetic factors, that would be the number one. When both parents are myopic, the risk is one in two, as compared to one in three when one parent is myopic. And environmental factors like, you know, uh, more than three hours of extensive near work with less than 1.5 hours of outdoor activity increases the risk of myopia by 2.6 times. Coupled with excessive time spent on gadgets, there is definitely a risk of myopia progression. Now we have COVID around and in COVID times, we have transitioned into e-learning. All our kids are on online classes from morning itself after that, they're going to log into their video games and to the daily dose of cartoons and TV channels, programs, and then, of course, YouTube videos. With coupled with that no outdoor play, there is a boom in quarantine myopia. With this alarming increase in screen time, we are seeing myopia booming day by day. So that brings us to the question, why should we prevent progression of myopia? This is because childhood myopia often progresses to high myopia in adult life. And we know that high myopia is associated with sight threatening complications like retinal detachment and CNVM. So the ultimate goal of any myopia control program would be to slow down myopia right in the years of most active eye growth, which would be childhood itself. So coming to the strategies of myopia management and control, you can classify them as environmental strategies, pharmacological or optical. So environmental strategies would be batting for increased outdoor time. So even uh, ICPOS recommends at least 40 minutes of outdoor activity in sunlight every day. So the theories uh, which uh, propagate this outdoor activities, uh, they uh, say that the light towards the UV end of the spectrum slows down eye growth and myopia and the high luminance kind of stimulates uh, dopamine release, which is a good hormone, which prevents the axial length elongation. Vitamin D, uh, vitamin D manufacturing also prevents the eye growth and outdoors when you are spending time, there is a decreased accommodative demand and there is an increased depth of focus and improved retinal image quality. So all these are uh, you know, uh, factors which would recommend increased outdoor time. So pharmacological options for progressive myopia, what are these pharmacological options? They're gaining popularity. Pyrincipine is a selective mesopharynic agent with high affinity for M1 and M4 receptors, which has shown promising results. 7-methylxanthine, an adenosine receptor antagonist, 
is still in research, but the star of today's pharmacological therapy is low-dose atropine, which has been found to have efficacy in myopia control. So why atropine? For once, the ophthalmologists are very familiar with this drug. It has been around for a very long time and is the only medication to be consistently effective in slowing myopia progression with a very good safety profile. So atropine has been used in myopia control for a very long time as early as 19th century, but it was the ATOM studies, which was the atropine for treatment of childhood myopia, which validated the efficacy of atropine in myopia control. Later came the ATOM 2 study, which uh, confirmed the efficacy of low-dose atropine, 0.01%, and then the LAMP studies, low concentration of atropine for myopia progression, LAMP 1 and 2, which found that 0.05% was also equally effective, if not better. So how does this atropine act? So the theories of action of atropine are controversial, but we know that it blocks the mesophonic receptors found in the eye, uh, in the ciliary muscle, retina, and sclera. So it has a, a mechanism of action on the gene expression, cell proliferation, and scleral remodeling, thereby preventing axial length elongation and myopia progression. So one theory is that it inhibits the glycosaminoglycan synthesis in the scleral fibroblasts, thereby preventing the axial length elongation. Another theory says that atropine produces some amount of pupillary dilatation, which increases the entry of UV light, which is actually good for your eyes in some in certain core amounts, and that can uh, harden the collagen and prevent the axial length elongation further. Another theory says that myopia is a state of chronic inflammation with a weakening of sclera and axial length elongation tendency. So atropine sort of inhibits this chronic inflammatory state and prevents axial length elongation. So if you look at the summary of evidence for atropine in myopia control, especially uh, the low dose atropine, it's plenty. First, the ATOM-1 study, it showed that atropine 1% eye drops slowed myopia progression significantly by 77% over two years with no axial length increase. The ATOM-2 study showed that 0.01% retarded myopia progression close to 50% with least side effects and rebound. The LAMP study found that even lower concentrations were good, but it was a 0.05% which was most effective. And the LAMP-2 confirmed the efficacy of 0.05% over other concentrations and found it to be effective uh, by about 64% uh, with an efficacy double that of 0.01% atropine. So low-dose atropine is definitely going to be around for some time and the best concentration and how long to use is still uh, you know, being uh, evaluated. Probably the, at the end of the LAMP study, we will know for sure uh, you know, how long we have to use the atropine and how much is the best option. So we also did a small study at our center which analyzed the efficacy of low-dose atropine uh, in children with progressive myopia. And we found that it gave about a 40 to 45% uh, efficacy in retarding myopia progression. And it was quite safe and effective in myopia control in children. So if you look at the conventional optical strategies, that is the single vision spectacles and contact lenses, like the soft contact lenses and Richard Gatt's permeable lenses, which we use conventionally in myopia treatment, they don't offer any benefit in myopia control. So if you really are looking at long-term in controlling progressive myopia, you have to think out of the box and look at other options. So the various options have been listed here. So I will briefly touch upon each. So for a long time, people have been undercorrecting myopia, thinking that the basic mechanism of uh, myopia progression is because of a hyperopic defocus. And if you induce a myopic defocus, by undercorrecting the child, it will reduce the accommodative demand and it will slow down myopia. But it doesn't work because the child is blurred for most of the time. And so this theory is abandoned now. So what is gaining popularity is use of multifocal spectacles, which are already popular in Western countries. Again, it works on the principle of uh, hyperopic defocus. So if you look at this picture, you can see this is an uncorrected myope and this is the image shell of the patient. So when we correct this patient with a traditional correction, the center part of the retina, yes, the light rays are getting focused there and the myopia is getting corrected. But look at the periphery, what is happening? So there is a hyperopic defocus which is happening. And it is this hyperopic defocus which researchers have found is responsible for the axial length elongation, tax like a stimulus for axial length elongation and progression of myopia. So researchers have found that for an optimal correction on a long-term basis, you need to have a, this sort of a 
uh, you know, image shell, which would either focus the image onto the retina or just in front of the retina so that there is a constant myopic defocus. So most of these spectacles work on the mechanism of inducing myopic shift in peripheral retinal, uh, peripheral retina and producing a myopic defocus. So they have, they are either bifocals or progressive lenses with an error add of plus one or plus two. So the prototype would be like this. You have concentric rings in the spectacles and the distant vision is marked by the white ring followed by the black rings, which are the uh, representing the plus power zones. Now, Adding to this, some new technology spectacles have come into uh, market. They're already popular in Western countries. One of them is the DIMS, that is the Defocus Incorporated Multiple Segment Spectacles. So uh, here you have a central zone for distant refractive correction and surrounded by, uh, you know, surrounding this uh, central zone, you have four, about 400 multiple defocus segments. So they have incorporated multiple defocus segments just around the central zone. So the idea is to create a simultaneous myopic retinal focus, both for distance and near viewing. And in this study, which was published uh, and had a follow-up of about two years from uh, Hong Kong, China, they found it to be effective in uh, reducing the refractive error progression by 50% and axial length elongation by 60%. So one prototype of this dim spectacles is MeoSmart Mio by Hoya, and it's gaining popularity. Another technology which is uh, gaining popularity is the HALT technology, which is highly aspherical lenslet target. So here, again, it works on the principle of myopic defocus, but here what they've done is uh, using highly aspherical uh, lenslets, what they are trying to do is to constantly deviate the light rays in a continuous three-dimensional manner so that a volume of myopic defocus is produced so that the image becomes uh, in this manner rather than a uh, hyperopic defocus. So again, it works on the principle of myopic defocus. And uh, one prototype is the Eslor Stellus lens, which is uh, available commercially abroad. And in this one-year study, uh, again from Hong Kong, China, they found it to be effective in reducing refractive error uh, progression by 70% and axial length elongation by 60%. So the disadvantages of these are they are frightfully expensive and uh, some of them are still in research. Coming to multifocal contact lenses, they are very popular uh, in, in uh, abroad, especially in the US. One prototype would be the MI, MI, MI site from Cooper Vision. Again, it works on the same principle of producing a myopic defocus. So there is a central 2mm distance zone, uh, which is surrounded by about two to five millimeter of increasing plus power. So the idea is again to create a sort of uh, image shell, which produces a constant myopic defocus. So the disadvantages of all these uh, lenses are again the difficulty in insertion and removal in small children, coupled with the you know uh, problems of contact lenses and the expense. So another contact lens which is gaining popularity is the extended depth of focus contact lenses. Uh, this is in article by, yeah, I will, by Padmaja Shankari Durg. They found it to be highly effective and it works on the principle of extended depth of focus. So natural view and one day pure are some of those uh, prototypes. Orthokeratology contact lenses are promising because they work on reversing the geometry of uh, cornea. They have a central zone of corneal flattening surrounded by corneal steepening, can correct up to six types of myopia, but the disadvantage is that you have to wear it overnight. It's expensive and the risk of infections and injuries to cornea are there. So Paragon CRT, GOV, Euclid are some of the prototypes. And uh, it is definitely an option if you have very progressive myopia. So if you look at the various efficacy of treatments, you will find that most of them give about uh, 40 to 70 percent uh, control in myopia progression. So if you have children who are still progressing despite pharmacological therapy, with low dose atropine, you can combine it with uh, multifocal contact lenses or multifocal spectacles or ortho -K lenses. So the future of myopia control would be based on genetic studies and genetic markers. Already a multitude of genes have been mapped and various loci of, uh, you know, have been found which are responsible for myopia. 
Along with that, we have to bring about effective screen time recommendations, especially in this COVID scenario with increasing screen time in all our children. There is definitely a boom of quarantine myopia. The MHRD and government of India has brought in certain guidelines, but many are not uh, abiding by this. And we have to ensure that they are strictly followed. So creating myopia awareness, recognizing myopia as a public health crisis will definitely go a long way in its management. So as ophthalmologists, what is our role? So masterly inactivity is not the need of the hour. We should act. We should assess the risk factors in each child, discuss the options with the parents, and decide the best treatment depending on the patient's wants and needs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nina. That was an excellent talk. And it emphasizes the role we as ophthalmologists uh, need to play in the society and probably actively, as you said, actively uh, increase the awareness and do something about it. Thank you very much. Now we have an, uh, our next speaker. And our next speaker is Dr. Niranjan Ferre. Uh, Dr. Niranjan is a pediatric ophthalmologist who is extremely passionate about cerebral visual impairment. He's a uh, he, he even uh, was, uh, element, uh, was crucial in starting an interdisciplinary care center for uh, children with CVI in Vijayawada. He, he's also actively involved at a national level in, uh, in the active involvement of uh, CVI, CVI children, children with CVI in the Rashtriya Bala Swasthya Karyakram by the, of the government of India. He's also part of the UNICEF Expert Mission Group, which developed a project for the early detection and intervention of children with disabilities in the zero to three years age group. He did a three month fellowship at the famous Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital for Children in London with focus on children in, with neurodisability. And currently he works at Liberia Eye Center run by the LB Prasad Eye Institute at the John F. Kennedy Memorial Medical Center, Monrovia, Liberia. And this is the only modern eye care facility in the whole country of Liberia. We welcome you, Dr. Nirajan, and we thank you for being uh, agreeing to talk to us about cerebral visual impairment. Over to you, Dr. Nirajan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sampruti, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Gopal and Team COC for giving this opportunity. It is always nostalgic to be a part of uh, an activity by COC because it feels like coming home again. And I have those nostalgic memories of attending COC meetings at the IMA Hall and various hotels in Cochin. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, CVI. So unlike the previous talks, it does not involve any, uh, um, you know, surgeries that make you go stunned or any recent myopia therapy or uh, myopia. But uh, this is something different. But I feel that um, this is something very important that we all need to know as ophthalmologists. So uh, I thought of uh, putting it in a way that we can practice it in whichever subspeciality we are and wherever we are, what is the minimum that we can do? So, have, so the objective of this present, presentation is to understand like having pressure to see loads of children on the revenues and the limited time that we have and with no background training to handle the children, what is it that I can do for the ch children with CVI and how? So uh, thinking on the lines of how to incorporate CVI into our routine clinical practice, I thought of dividing uh, the things that we can do into must do, things that would be great if one can do, and things that would be ideal if one can do. At the outset, we need to understand that CVI is a medical condition only till a diagnosis is made. Because there is no surgery, there is no medication, or there is no proven therapy that can fix it forever. So after that, it is completely a habilitational or an educational condition. What is our scenario? Is it something that we all should pay attention to? Yes, we must. All of us who see children in the clinics have now realized that, are slowly now realizing that the overall amount of cataract in children is coming down. If you look at the blindness as such because of cataract, ROP or glaucoma is coming down. We looked at 
our own set of children with a profound visual impairment aged less than three years. And we found that this is actually the most common cause of visual impairment in young children. And majority of them were aged less than two years who presented with profound visual impairment and associated with that, there were delay in various other areas of development. The high functioning CVI that the Western literature talks about very often, where the children's visual activities and visual fields are normal or near normal, and they have issues more with the higher processing of vision, such cases are very few in our community. They definitely do exist, but they do not surface to show us. Now, none of us have received any training to handle such children before. So what is it that we can do now? So among the list of must do things, first one is the diagnosis. Second is identifying and managing the treatable ophthalmic issues. Counseling the family about the condition, prognosis, and what is their role. Appropriate referral to rehabilitation centers and therapists and save the family and the child from pseudotherapies. So about diagnosis without putting any complex definition and debate about which one is right. Practically speaking, CVI should be suspected in any child whose presenting symptoms or visual behaviors do not match with the clinical ocular examination. This is especially so for a high functioning CVI where the child has normal or near normal acuity, but he is unable to recognize familiar people or he keeps bumping against things on the floor. Like this particular child with a visual acuity of 20, 40, and six is brought by his uh, family because he frequently falls. And recently he, fe he fell down badly that he has injured his one leg. So they went to pediatrician, orthopedician. Everybody said he's fine. There shouldn't be any problem. Then they thought of checking the vision. They went to several eye clinic. They said the vision is fine. And we thought of checking his visual fields. And what we see here is that when we test his visual fields, like this uh, a form of confrontation test where we use a puppet face popping from the different sides of a black card in the center, which block the central field. And then when this puppet face is shown from different sides, the child is literally inattentive to the face shown in the lower field. So this is suggestive of a lower field impairment, which is precisely the cause of his frequent falls, which sometimes becomes a safety issue. And there is a cause for it. He has got a bilateral parietal infarct, which is causing him those lower visual field defects. Like this girl is brought by parents saying that she's being very clumsy. Whenever she tries to approach things, she makes mistakes and that makes her look lousy. So when we offer her something in the clinic to catch, look at the way she goes about it. She goes around it and then scoops it in rather than uh, going precisely and catching it. This is called optic ataxia. She's very confused when she has to pick her dress from the cupboard. So we thought of testing it in the clinic by giving her a set of objects. We call it object sorting test. This is not described in any book, but this is something that we found uh, quite useful where you just accumulate a few objects in the basket and ask her to find out something. And she just cannot see it though it is right in front of her. And she has to pick them up one by one, see what is it, and then she is able to recognize it. So that is how she's confused when there are too many things around her. But if you keep one thing, she can reach out to it uh, precisely, describe what it is, and there is no confusion at all about anything. So this is suggestive of a symptom called simultanagnosia, where the child cannot see too many things at a time. So whenever parents say something, pay attention to it and is ocular examination describing those symptoms. If not, think of a brain pathology. One of the commonest symptoms that families bring children with is child seems to see well sometimes and sometimes not so well. So it may be taken as a sign of malingering that the child sees when there is something of interest and not something that doesn't excite him. There is a limited span of visual attention. It is hard to make this child read for even for five minutes. Making use of other senses, like they like to touch or taste or hear something rather than see it and understand what is it. They take unduly longer time compared to other children to understand something. They have significant problems with eye-hand coordination, difficulties in recognizing people by seeing them, difficulty in understanding the language of facial expression. The child can, can't make out if the teacher is angry or happy 
and that is why he is not able to reciprocate similar emotions or behave appropriately as per the teacher which can be labeled as a sign of being a disobedient student or a stupid student difficulty in seeing moving things when there are a lot of children moving in the school and playing together this guy just cannot participate in that game difficulty in judging distances and depths difficulty in getting oriented to a new surrounding the child just doesn't like to go to a function hall with the family and he always keeps crying over there so if we see such complaints which cannot be ex explained by the ocular examination think of cvi have a look at the neuroimaging the imaging we all know the topography of different functions in the brain and if an occipital lobe on the right side is knocked off we can expect uh, a left sided visual impairment and things like that about the each lobe like this particular child was brought by the family with history of stroke on the right side we can say that the volume of brain on the right side is grossly reduced in uh, especially involving the posterior parts of the occipital and the parietal lobes so what do we expect this child to have like this child should be having a gross inattention for things on the left side so when you show the child an illuminated object on the left though it is close by the child just doesn't recognize it pay attention to it but when it is on the right the child quickly looks at it so this has a significant bearing on the way the family interacts with the child to teach him new things and at the same time the several safety concerns and whenever there is a damage involving the right parietal lobe there is a significant issue with the child's attentional abilities not only on the left side but overall attentional abilities are affected now we should not get totally uh, knocked off by looking at the imaging like this child has so much uh, cavitary changes because of the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy there are literal holes in the occipital lobe so one would feel that oh this child may not have any useful vision but this child can actually move around comfortably without any help so there is lot of neuroplasticity and reorganization of various functions that happens so the neuroimaging may not really predict but it certainly helps us to organize ourselves and uh, make up our mind when we approach the child to uh, have an idea about what to expect during examination and prepare ourselves accordingly one another simple test that can help us pick up this high functioning cvi is when their acuities are normal is to check the best corrected visual acuity with linear single optotypes versus a whole linear optotype the whole line acuity versus a single optotype acuity if this ratio is more than 2 be suspicious of the dorsal stream dysfunction so dorsal stream is the one which helps us focus on the object of interest among the many objects which are there in the environment so suppose the child's visual acuity at 3 meters is 20 by 125 with a line acuity and with single optotype it is 20 by 30 the crowding ratio is 4 and that makes us suspicious that the child could be having a dorsal stream dysfunction which could explain several of the complaints that we just talked about so this is these are the two simple things that one can do uh if the complaints cannot be explained suspect cvi look at the imaging whether it supports your hypothesis simple visual acuity by testing this uh, by this way uh, single optotype versus the line acuity may give us a fairly good ground to suspect cvi now ocular and cerebral visual impairments they often coexist and one of the most common impairment that is seen is the uh, weak accommodation so dynamic rentoscopy is something that has to be done for every child and if there is any evidence of weak, weak accommodation that has to be factored in and corrected uh, for the child that helps uh, them to be involved with their near world if the child is not at all cooperative for the dynamic rentoscopy that we just showed we can have a few ready made plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 glasses in the clinic and as seen in this video this child is not at all looking at the faces but on putting this plus 4 glass he immediately becomes attentive to the face because now uh, he need no, no accommodation deficit is corrected cataract high myopia it may sound very simple to our crowd but it is a fact that a lot of children with intellectual impairment their treatable eye problems remain untreated for years decades thinking that correcting those is not going to help the child while on the other side not correcting them is like adding a disability on top of an pre-existing irreversible disability 
which is very unfair on the child. Now, after correcting these problems, uh, what is it that we should talk to the family? What the doctor tells the family in the first visit goes a long way uh, in terms of how the family looks at the child and his future. Most of these parents have never heard anything good about their child, but there is something on which the child is doing well. There is something the, that the child is good at. We should talk about those strengths. Yes, there is hemiplegia on the left side, like the child I just showed you the video of who was in attend to things on the right. Yes, he has left hemiplegia, she has left hemiplegia, but let us talk about the right upper and lower limb, which is working well. And let us uh, explore the ways of engaging the child with that upper and lower limb. One thing that we always tell our parents is that a child with CVI is very unlikely to be completely blind. Because if we take an example of say, a child with LCA, the end organ is completely damaged and there is no way that you can reverse it. But so much part of the brain is devoted for vision processing that the entire brain being damaged is very unlikely. There is no pathology which damages the entire brain involved in vision processing. So it's very unlikely that the child is uh, completely blind because of brain damage. It's just that we need to find those situations where that vision is, is activated with the help of other senses or without the help of other senses and how we can get the child involved. Like this child was brought by the parents saying that he just doesn't look at the faces. But if you make the room dark, put light on your face, give the child that extra help of tactile clues by keeping his hand on your face and you talk in a slow pace, uttering very simple words that the child is familiar with and the child is engaged in the facial communication, which he wasn't earlier. So it's just about creating a situation which can engage the child. We must tell the family that it's a lifelong condition. Don't think that by coming over here a few months, here, the child is going to get cured of it. The aim of our interaction is to find the residual vision and ways to nurture it, providing the necessary environment so that he can be on his own for his routines. That is what we are looking for. And the people who can help yeah. the child is Excuse the... Excuse me, sir. Yes. Can I miss her? So time is almost over, sir. All right. Then let me go to the slide of conclusion. So in summary, uh, this is what we had just described that the diagnosis, then management of the treatable problems, counseling, referral to people who can manage the child and save the child from pseudotherapies. There are several centers which offer different therapies which just do not work, but they, but they waste the important time, which is crucial for the child's neuroplasticity. It would be good if one can get trained in functional vision evaluation, because as vision professionals, nobody understands vision better than us. It would be ideal if in your own clinic, you can build a system which can provide the child all the services under one roof. Because apart from vision, children have a lot of other challenges. And if you decide to work on vision alone, it is not going to work. So how do we make all the services available under one roof? because catering to all the services in different service centers itself becomes a source of stress for the child and the family. And how far you want to go, it is up to you. And most of the time the resource and help will follow. These are some of the books that you can refer to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Niranjan. That was an excellent talk and your videos really show how passionate and how far you go to, and how, how much you care for your, 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 the, the patients. It really shows what, uh, what, and your actions actually speak more than your words. Thank you very much. He's part of Cochin of the Army Club, Baru. Yes. <laughs> very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, we are running a bit late. That's why otherwise we could have had some more time and discussion. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. So our next speaker, is uh, Dr. Sachin Kedar. Dr. Sachin is a professor and is just recently now moved to Emory University. He is a unique combination of an ophthalmologist who has subsequently had training in neuroophthalmology and also done a residency in neurology. So it's a very rare combination and it's a, uh, it's, we are indeed privileged to have him uh, as, a, as a speaker for this uh, webinar. And he's also done uh, a training in clinical neurophysiology 
and he's now a board certified neurologist who specializes in neuroophthalmology and ocular electrophysiology. His clinical interests include multiple sclerosis, optic neuritis, pupillary abnormalities, eye movement disorders, unexplained visual loss, and clinical neurophysiology. We are indeed happy to have you here and we request you to give your talk. Thank you, Dr. Sutton. Dr. Sutton is going to speak to us about a detailed neuroophthalmology evaluation. Over to you, Dr. Sutton. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I think Nia has to sh stop sharing. Okay, is everybody able to see my screen? Yes, Dr. Sajid. Thank, thank, thank you. Well, thank you for the welcome, uh, Dr. Gopal and uh, all the panelists. Uh, the task that I have today is in 12 minutes to go over the essential neuroophthalmology assessment. I must say that my task is a little easier because I'm coming towards the end. And the talk by uh, Dr. Niranjan was fantastic. It, it, it does a lot of things that I wish to cover today, so I can go over it very quickly. For a neuro-ophthalmologist, patient history is everything. So spend sufficient amount of time understanding what the patient's problems are, because it helps to have a few differentials by the end and you can actually tailor your assessment appropriately. When I see a patient in my clinic, this is the basic schema that I use. In order for images to be seen, you have to have clear image capture by the eye, which then has to be transmitted with high fidelity to the visual cortex. From there, information is processed by the association cortices and finally, some meaningful action happens either in terms of comprehension or a verbal output. A significant part of the process of seeing actually happens through cognitive processes, including attention. And finally, there are efferent pathways where the eye movements are programmed and executed. So this is a complete circuitry and problems anywhere in this circuitry can manifest as visual problems. This is the basic examination of the eye that I'm sure everybody in our audience is familiar with. It tests pretty much everything that pertains to the circuitry with few exceptions. In fact, if you do this examination in every patient, you should be able to pick up at least three fourths of all neuroophthalmic cases. I won't go over it in any detail. If I have a patient where I suspect an afferent pathway problem at the end of my history taking, I might add a few additional testing, which are listed in red over here, contrast sensitivity maybe, uh, optic nerve imaging, maybe some electrophysiology and neuroimaging is appropriate. Not in every case, but selectively depending on my differentials. Similarly, if I suspect a problem of the efferent pathway, then the things highlighted in red are additional testing, which you don't do as part of your basic eye examination, pertinently cranial nerve examination, because remember, at least four of the cranial nerves will, uh, will serve the, uh, sorry, five of the cranial nerves will serve uh, the orbital region. Examination of higher order vision is important and is not something that a general ophthalmologist is usually taught of in any detail. And uh, Niranjan went over it in some detail and I really appreciate that because I don't have to explain all of these. I will be using a case-based approach to see how you might use these basic tools as you approach a patient with vision problems. Let's start with a simple one. And you might recognize this patient. This is a 47-year-old physician who has been having difficulty reading for one year, difficulty reading fine print. Patient enlarges the font on the computer and smartphone to read, often slips off his glasses or extends his arms out to focus at near no pertinent past medical history other than migraine and myopia. On examination, pretty much everything is normal with the exception of near acuity as highlighted in red. And when you go back to the basic schema, you know that this is a problem with image capture, which, which is not being captured clearly for near. 
And the next step, you will refract this patient and you find that with appropriate mirror ad, they are 6-6 in both eyes and you've diagnosed uncorrected refractive error, press biopia. And to those who guess this patient as the presenter, full marks to you. Let's go to another case. So this is a 60-year-old male who presents with acute, painless, progressive loss of vision of the right eye for the last five days. Past medical history is significant for sleep apnea, hypertension, and he's a chronic smoker. So you do a basic eye examination and highlighted in red are the abnormalities, reduced visual acuity, color vision, feel loss in the right eye associated with a right RATD and a right optic disc edema as shown in the pictures. Ocular motility and alignment on normal pupils, as I said, RAPD. So you now know that this is a problem of image transmission. So something is wrong in getting that image from the eye to the brain. So a patient with disc edema, this is how I generally approach it. This is a very simplistic schema. You first decide if the patient has true disc edema. If they have true disc edema, is there vision loss? If there's vision loss, is it painful or painless? And then you come to a few differentials and based upon the age group of our patient and the cardiovascular risk factor, you strongly suspect that this is ischemic. You, based on history, will rule out giant cell arthritis. Your diagnosis is most likely non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. You might want to palpate the temporal arteries to make sure it is non-tender. You might want to get a CBC, ESR, and C-reactive protein to firmly rule out giant cell arteritis. All right, let's go to case three. So this is a 66 year old patient with a two week history of ptosis of the right eye, intermittent double vision for two weeks prior, a pressure sensation behind the right eye, no headache, history of hypertension, diabetes, which is well controlled. And you're immediately thinking this is probably an efferent system problem. So you will do your full basic eye examination. You find that the afferent system is completely normal External examination shows complete ptosis of the right upper eyelid. You lift the eye and you find the eye in the down and out position. Pupil is five millimeter and fixed on the right side. Dilated frontoscopic examination is normal. As I said, this is a problem of the efferent system where the eyes are not moving okay. You will then go on to perform some more testing of ocular motility you find that there is no nystagmus, no saccharic intrusion when you're checking the eyes for stability of fixation. Range of movements is significantly reduced in the right eye, especially up gaze, down gaze, and medial gaze. Saccades are absent in these directions. Pursuits are limited in these directions, and he's unable to converge the right eye. You will now do a focused cranial nerve examination because you're suspecting cranial nerve three is involved. You will check for in portion by asking the patient to look down. If you look at the medial blood vessel over here, it rotates down so you know the fourth nerve is intact. Patient is able to abduct, you know, sixth nerve is intact. You check for sensation of the cornea and around the eye, and you notice that there is anesthesia in the territory of the right V1 nerve. You now go back to your neuroanatomy. You know that the third and the fifth nerve lie in close proximity in the superior orbital fissure cavernous sinus. You will have to get neuroimaging in this patient. There is no questions. You immediately send them. You will see a large tumor, probably a meningioma originating in the middle temporal fossa and impinging on the um, uh, superior orbital fissure. Patient will go to neurosurgery after this. Case number four. Is a 36 year old female who presents to your clinic saying that her neck hurts and that recently she's noticed that her eyes are different in size. Started a week after she was in a high speed roller coaster and she probably twisted her neck. She also noticed a dull right sided headache. She denies any change in vision, no double vision, no neurological symptoms, no significant past medical history, no medications. So you think that this is probably not afferent, probably not efferent, and so you want to do your basic eye exam. The only abnormalities on the basic eye exam as highlighted are two millimeter ptosis of the right upper lid, right lower lid. You can see that there is a scleral show. That's because of 
an abnormal elevation of the left eyelid to compensate for the ptosis on the other side. You notice the anasocoria with the right pupil smaller than the left pupil. Go back to your pupillary examination and the approach to anasocoria. This is again a very simple version of how you'll approach it. Once you've figured out that there is an anasocoria, you want to test in light and dark. If the pupil is size is, if the anasocoria is worse in dark, it means that the sympathetic system of the small pupil is affected. You check for dilation lag and upper eyelid ptosis and lower eyelid ptosis, which is present in our patient. You then check with apraclonidine eye drops to see if there is sympathetic denervation. And indeed, if the anasocoria reverses, you confirm Horner's. Now you can see the pathway if the other conditions are true in light and dark. Bottom line, anasocoria should always be tested in light and in dark. So you diagnose Horner's syndrome. This is an acute condition. You will immediately send a patient to the emergency room to get a head and neck imaging. And this patient had a dissection of the right internal carotid artery, as you can see out here, probably because of neck trauma. And she was seen by neurology and neurosurgery to see if she needed to be on anticoagulation, which she luckily did not. Last case. This is a 66 year old who presents with visual difficulty, says that they have difficulty reading, frequent falls, and family has noticed that she runs into walls as if blind. There is no headache, no eye pain, but family says that over the past one year, she has been slightly forgetful. Past medical history is significant for cataract surgery, but is otherwise perfectly healthy. So now you're thinking that this might be an afferent pathway problem. So you do your basic eye examination and you're surprised that the best corrected visual acuity is six or six in both eyes. Color vision is abnormal to the point that she cannot even identify the control plate on the Isihara. Stereo acuity is absent. Confrontation fields show a left homonymous hemianopia. Rest of the examination is normal and now you find that this does not clearly fit into afferent pathway or the efferent pathway. And indeed you're dealing with cortical visual impairment or as we call it, higher visual process abnormalities. So vision processing, as you know, occurs through two major information streams. The dorsal pathway deals with spatial processing. The ventral pathway deals with object processing or the characteristics of objects. Next step, you will assess reading. See how does she do as, as a reader? Now, this is a video I hope you can Inside hear. Inside the big box on the table. The two friends. Did not know what time to play. Or the play would start. So you can see the problems that she has in reading, stuttering, uh, not stuttering, uh, misses her, misses lines, misses words, misses uh, enunciation of words, despite the visual activity being normal. What? You will next check and see if there is a neglect phenomenon. So neglect is when the person, irrespective of whether the visual field is intact or not, completely misses one half of the visual field, usually the left side. You do a letter cancellation test where you present a series of letters, ask the patient to cancel them. You can see that they are able to locate everything on the right, but nothing on the left. And you do a line bisection test where you ask the patient to bisect a line and you can see the bias towards the right side, all of which indicates a left hemineglect phenomenon. Simultanagnosia, as we saw in the last lecture, is the inability to perceive a single object out of multiple different objects, or as we call it, missing the forest for the tree. And everybody should be able to read the color plate on the Isihara, but she could not because she was focused Excuse on a single thought. Yes. So time is almost over. I'm All so right, good. thank you. Okay. <laughs> And you will also confirm this by using a complex picture such as this cookie theft picture. And you find that the patient focuses on a single aspect of the picture as opposed to all the components in the picture. So you diagnose simultanagnosia. You will also try and do some visual spatial screening tests. And I use the Montreal Cognitive Assessment screen. 
This is called the alternate trails making where the patient is supposed to connect the lines, uh, the numbers and the letters alternately. You can see they find it difficult to do so. And this is because of inability to select a single uh, stimulus coming into the brain. This is called disexecutive function. Unable to copy a cube, this is called construction apraxia. And you can see a clock phase. You ask the patient to draw a clock. They are completely focused only on the right side, not on the left side. And even the right side, you can see how distorted that space appears to be for them. You look at the MRI, and if you focus on the MRI anterior posteriorly, you can see the posterior part of the brain is significantly atrophic compared to the anterior portion and you diagnose this patient to have Alzheimer's disease or posterior cortical atrophy. So to summarize, history is the most critical component of the neuroophthalmic assessment. Your basic eye examination is sufficient for you to know which part of the visual circuitry is being affected. And if, you, if it doesn't fall into any specific category of the afferent or the efferent pathway, always consider higher visual function disorder. Thank you. I'm sorry I ran a couple of minutes over, but I hope uh, that was uh, a, a overview of neuro-ophthalmology assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sachin. That was a brilliant masterclass, really. And we've just learned a lot. And it also makes uh, the job of the next two speakers a lot easier because you've shown a case of discadema as well and how we went about it. So I think, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, are you going to uh, speak next? Yes, yes. Yes, so I invite Dr. Thomas Aaron Burgess uh, to speak on differentials of uh, dyskedema. So Dr. Thomas Aaron has been introduced earlier. He is a consultant at Jacob's Eye Hospital, Cochin, and has a very special interest in neuroophthalmology. Over to you, Dr. Thomas Aaron. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just share my screen. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Sachin's uh, brilliant class on neuroophthalmology examination and evaluation has made my job a lot easy. I'm going to focus on discadema differentials. So these are the few cases of uh, discadema I've seen over the last 24 years. They all look very different. And also the etiology is also very different as well. But we can, if we go systematically, as Dr. Sachin had mentioned, we can definitely identify the cause. My mentor in neuroophthalmology, Mr. Barr, used to use this mnemonic, invited the edge which is a, a list of case, uh, causes of uh, optic neuropathy or discadema, which is also applicable for cases of, say, uveitis and any medical cause, really. So inherited cases, causes neoplastic, vascular, in, infection, inflammation, immunological, iatrogenic, toxic, traumatic, endocrine, degenerative, and in the, the very unusual uh, cause in the case of discadema, uh, hypotony. So it looks like a lot of causes, but if you go systematically, we can definitely identify the cause. Dr. Sachin has stressed the importance of history in uh, neuroophthalmology, because in most ophthalmology conditions, history is not that very important, but in neurology and neuroophthalmology, history is extremely important. And then of course, based on the history of focused examination and when necessary, the appropriate investigations. So you, you use your ears for the history, your eyes for the examination, and if necessary, go for the further investigations. So approach to discadema history, what uh, focuses on additional symptoms. So any additional symptoms the patient says, I'll, I'll show you uh, what I mean. Like say diplopia, transient obscuration of vision. All these are going to give you some clues as to the possible etiology. The examination, Dr. Sachin has shown the slide. So you go systematically differentiate true versus pseudo discadema unilateral versus bilateral, which to, because the, it's very useful. And then optic nerve function, this is the optic nerve function. Sometimes you guess an optic nerve uh, edema, but normal function. So that's like in, like in the case of papillary edema. General examination, look for other clues and blood pressure and additional ophthalmic features. I will show you uh, examples of that. 
and where necessary appropriate investigations. So our tools, of course, are the years to listen to the history, our instruments, you have the uh, tor two torches, a bright and a dim torch to check the pupil, the uh, 20D lens, and then you have the uh, red and white hat pin to look up for a confrontation field. And here I'm feeling for the temporal, superficial temporal artery of a patient. The five C's of, of uh, optic disc edema, the color, the cup, the contour, circulation, and the complete retina. This is a very rare set of photographs. You have a patient who had a fundus photograph done in 2008 for a doubtful nerve fiber layer defect. You can see supratemporally, but she came in 2015 with a disc edema. So all, you can see a patient where the disc, before a disc edema and with a disc edema. You can see all the C's have changed. The color has become hypremic. The cup is obliterated. The contour, the margins are blurred. The circulation, you can see the vessels are dilated and some blurring of vessels as they pass over the disc. And then the surrounding retina, or complete retina, you can see the exudation into the surrounding retina. And using a red-free light is very useful to analyze the nerve fiber layer. So true versus pseudo ischemia, the two Cs I find most useful to differentiate are the cup. In true discadema, surprisingly, the cup is actually retained till late. While in pseudo discadema, like usual causes of optic disc drusen, hypermetropia, very often the cup is absent. The myelinated nerve fiber, I don't think really you're going to confuse with the uh, uh, papilledema, but sometimes it may make, cause a confusion. And the other C I find very useful is circulation. You can see in the true discadema, there is uh, uh, blurring of the vessels as they pass over the disc. They're not seen very clearly. While in, especially in the case of disc trucent, you've got anomalous branching of the vessels over the optic disc. And also you can see in the other case, the vessels are seen quite clearly in the case of hypermetropia. So the cup and the circulation are most useful in differentiating true versus pseudo disc edema. So few, showing you a few examples, this is a case this patient I showed you earlier with the uh, optic disc appearance with a presbyo referred by another ophthalmologist, doubtful papilledema. And you can see there's a lumpy, bumpy appearance of the optic disc. So you can put your patient on your fundus camera and with the autofluorescence mode, you can see the disc is, the drusen are lighting up beautifully. And you're still doubtful, you can do a fluorescent angiogram. You can see the disc is staining beautifully, but not, there is absolutely no leaking of the, of the, from the disc. So this is a case of optic disc drusen. Now, once you've uh, identified true disc edema, then looking at unilateral versus bilateral is very, very important and useful. Unilateral, you can think of unilateral causes like posterior scleritis, optic neuritis, AIO, and neuroretinitis, or say a compression in the orbit. So all these are made uni unilateral. While the, if it's a bilateral disc edema, you're thinking of papilledema, ICSOL, hypertension, and systemic causes. And we'll, I'll show you examples of these. The additional features are very useful in, in identifying the cause. So suppose you have a unilateral optic neuropathy. What I mean in optic neuropathy is optic disc edema with involvement of uh, optic nerve function. So if there is additional pain, like Dr. Sachin had shown, they're thinking optic neuritis, if a sudden onset uh, uh, pain and swelling and blurring, and when you see there's a pallid disc swelling, you're thinking AION. If there's other cranial nerve involvement, you're thinking orbital epics, or like Dr. Sachin showed the case of superior orbital fissure involvement. A retinal exudation, you're thinking neuroretinitis. Choroiditis, you're thinking of possible TB, proptosis, thyroid associated ophthalmopathy or, or, or an orbital mass. If it's unilateral disc edema, just pain, but uh, optic dysfunction is normal, you're probably thinking posterior scleritis. Again, if it is bilateral, bilateral disc edema with the macular fan, you're thinking raised ICT, bilateral disc edema with the extensive retinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, probably systemic hypertension, bilateral disc edema with pain, anterior segment and posterior segment inflammation, you're thinking VKH or sarcoidosis. Bilateral optic neuropathy, where the optic nerve function is affected, you think pituitary or craniopharyngioma, some sort of tumor or toxic. And we're going to see some examples. This is a lady I saw while working in the UK, 35-year-old uh, with decreased vision in the left eye. You can see there's a unilateral disc edema. And you can see when you, there's a fullness of the temporal fossa. So here I'd like to emphasize, especially the postgraduate, the importance of having a good general look at the patient before you put the patient on the slit lamp. So because this is a crucial finding, because otherwise you could be doing all sorts of imaging and very suspect a bony lesion, a CT scan is always better than MRI. Uh, another patient, the 47 year old, slightly on the older age group, decreased vision left eye for three days, and you, all the optic nerve function parameters were affected. Uh, mm -hmm. What I mean is vision, color vision, pupil, mm -hmm. and visual field all were affected. So this is a left one, you use one side, left side unilateral optic neuropathy. And then you do the uh, a typical optic neuritis should behave in a particular pattern. 
So you send to the neurologist for any other features and the investigations in the K optic neuritis, you're going to do all these investigations, the blood, the hemogram, ESR, CRP, as Dr. Sachin mentioned, general general after ESR is going to give you a big clue. Peripheral smear, RBS, lipid profile. In India, you have to rule out tuberculosis before you start steroids, so MAT2 and chest X-ray. And of course, more, and, and nowadays with the, uh, atypical optic neuritis, we are thinking of equiporin antibody and MOG antibodies. And where necessary, the appropriate imaging, CT scan, MRI, and I'll show you examples of these. So this typical optic neuritis, it should behave, as I said, worsen you for two weeks and then start improving by four weeks, which is exactly how this patient behaved. So typical optic neuritis, only uh, confirmed, diagnosis confirmed in retrospect. <coughs> this is another patient in the typical optic neuritis age group, but you can see 29-year-old female, headache and pain, right eye, decreased vision for one month. Uh, just a unilateral disclaimer, other disc is absolutely normal. And there was only thing, suspicion was there was an area of suspected exudation in pro nasally. And so while we were investigating for tuberculosis, the mantle was abnormal and also contiferon TB was gold. And while under investigation, she developed this new lesion in the choroid. So this was a case of clear-cut case of tuberculous choroiditis presenting with op as optic neuritis. And with ATT and, and dodo steroids, she had a very good outcome. <coughs> This is another gentleman, 41-year-old male, carpenter, decreased vision left eye for two weeks. So the feature you see, there is not just optic disc edema, there is also edema of the adjacent retina. So this is a case of clinically, a case of neuroretinitis. <coughs> Excuse me. When you get a, a finding, go back and ask the relevant questions. So you ask and you, get, you give a history of cascade two months ago. And with the uh, treatment of uh, antibiotics and steroids, he had made a full recovery. <coughs> The, uh, the importance of the other eye findings, not just to identify whether it's unilateral, bilateral optic neuropathy or disc edema, is a 65 year old female, decreased vision in the left eye for three days. And she said the right eye vision has been quite bad for the last one year. And what you see is a case of optic atrophy on the right side <coughs> and optic disc edema on the left side. So this is a case of Foster Kennedy or pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome, which is what we see more nowadays. So one side optic atrophy, optic disc edema on the other side. <clears throat> this is a 35-year-old female, complains of a headache and double vision. And she gave a history of oral contraceptive pills and recent episode of diarrhea. <clears throat> On examination, she had a bilateral papilledema and a six nerve palsy. So the, as you know, six nerve palsy is a false localizing sign. Always check blood pressure. <clears throat> But what she had was, in the case of optic disc edema, bilateral papillary edema, you always should do MRI and an MRV. And the MRV showed that there was thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. So she was already on oral contraceptive pills, and the episode of diarrhea had produced a hypercoagulable state, leading to thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. And fortunately, with appropriate treatment, TPA was infused, and you can see there is a recovery of the uh, blood flow in the superior sagittal sinus. So in a case of bilateral two disc edema, always MR venography should be done. And even if that doesn't give, give, uh, give us the diagnosis, the patient made a uh, lumbar puncture and the CSF should be done, uh, sent for the appropriate studies. Mm -hmm. Last few patients is a 28-year-old housewife who came with complaint of, came for a routine refraction. And you can see there's bilateral disc edema. And then you go back and again, ask the relevant history. So she gave history of transient obscuration of vision and also a history of recent increase in weight. And she got a bilateral disc edema. So sent to the neurologist and they diagnosed as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And with weight reduction, she made a good recovery. But this is the case of disc edema. As you can see, there's extensive cotton wool spots. So as I said, with disc edema, the plus feature, the cotton wool spots gives us a clue that most likely the cause is systemic hypertension. Check the blood pressure, blood pressure 210 over 130. So coming to the last, the last few slides, the take home messages, the detailed history, the, the history tells us, gives you a big clue as to what is the possible problem, because it's, you can have a say a hemianopia happening over uh, a day or a few hours, which indicates it's a vascular, while a hemianopia developing over a few months tells you that it's probably a compressive lesion. So focused examination, so differentiate true versus pseudo disc edema, unilateral versus bilateral, look for additional features, systemic examination and blood pressure and do the appropriate investigations. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Thomas Arun, for that uh, wonderful presentation, as always. Thank you. Uh, would you introduce Dr. Rehana next? Yes. I have great pleasure in introducing Dr. Rehana Rashid. Dr. Rehana is assistant uh, professor. Dr. Uh, Nia, can you share the slide, please? Yeah. Dr. Rekhna is the assistant professor at uh, Amrita uh, of Institute of uh, Medical Sciences. She did a med uh, medical training from uh, Trishur and ophthalmology from RIO Trivandrum. She did a fellowship in medical retina and ocular inflammation from Bristol Eye Hospital, United Kingdom, and uh, had extensive experience in neuroophthalmology during her work at James Cook University in the, in the UK and her, and her current position at Amrita. Over to you, Dr. Rekhna. Dr. Rahna is going to talk to us about optic disc pallor and optic neuropathy evaluation. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Arun, for that introduction. Um, I'll be talking about disc pallor, the essential worker. So what is disc pallor? Normally, the disc has a color that is a pink color which uh, with the temporal part of the disc having a less color compared to the basal one. So optic disc pallor means this normal color is blocked or sometimes the temporal part of the disc become more, the physiological temporal pallor become more intensified. So optic atrophy is change in color of the disc along with defective optic nerve function like uh, defective vision, color vision, visual field defect or pupillary abnormalities. It, re it results from irreversible damage to the retinal ganglion cells or axons from the retina to the lateral genically body occurs due to changes in blood supply, axonal loss, and light tissue proliferation. So the workup of this pallor depends upon whether this pallor is unilateral or bilateral, whether there is history of rapid decrease in vision at presentation, or when the patient had a defective vision or slowly progressive decrease in vision, whether the disc pallor is total involving the whole of the disc, or if it is partial, like temporal disc pallor or bota atrophy as is classically described in highest a cell lesions or optic tract lesions or sectoral pallor as in post anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And also the diagnosis also depends upon uh, age of the patient, a good history as uh, Dr. Sachin and Dr. Adam has already stressed upon and comorbidities and ancillary test. So first of all, we should know whether it is a true disc pallor or not. Some of the conditions can mimic as a disc pallor, like non-pathological conditions. If you are using a very bright light for examination, the disc will appear pallid or if you are taking bright light for photos, it will appear pallid. Axial myopia and pseudophagic um, pallor of the disc, that is also what we all know about. Other causes of pallid disc include disc drusens, myelinated nerve fibers, and polypomas. So what are the causes of optic atrophy? The optic atrophy uh, is um, occurring due to some process which has happened in the optic nerve. It could be due to a post-inflammatory like a post-optic neuritis from MS or any inflammatory conditions, ischemia like anti-ischemic or posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, compressive lesions, raised intracranial tension causing papilledema, nutritional deficiencies, toxic uh, causes causing toxic optic neuropathy, hereditary conditions, and childhood optic atrophy. The optic atrophy can be either bilateral or unilateral. Usually the bilateral ones are post papilledema which affects both eyes, secondary to retinal degeneration, toxic optic neuropathies, inherited optic neuropathies, like uh, leathers or autosomal dominant nutritional optic neuropathies. And unilateral, unilateral optic atrophies are mainly papillitis, post AAOing, compressive optic neuropathy, traumatic and infiltrative. But unilateral can also present bilat as bilateral optic atrophy. So what are the key features of optic atrophy? Decreased visual acuity, related acting pupillary defect, visual field defect like central or centrocecal photomas, altitudinal visual field or uh, temporal hemianopias, dyschromatopsia, that is defective color vision, optic disc pallor, of course, and reduced number of blood vessels on the disc surface, which is called Keston bohm sign, and thinning of the blood vessels around the disc. So uh, ophthalmoscopic examination-wise, it can be classified as primary, secondary, consecutive, and glucomatous. So in this um, presentation, we will be dealing with uh, primary and secondary optic atrophy workup. So what is primary optic atrophy? That is a disc which was not edematous before has gone into atrophy. The disc appearance will be, they will be having a chalky white disc with sharp margins and the disc can be seen. It will be shallow, but it can be seen. 
And causes of primary optic atrophy is mainly retrobulbar, and it includes pituitary tumors, that is, compressive lesions or optic nerve tumors or traumatic optic neuropathies or post optic neuritis due to MS or any inflammatory condition. Secondary optic atrophy, on the other hand, is due to long standing swelling of the optic disc, like papillitis or papilledema. It occurs due to damage to the swelling of the disc with glial proliferation and filling of the lamina fibrosa. So the disc usually have a yellow vaccine or dirty white color. With the margins is not that well defined as a primary optic atrophy. The cup will be obliterated due to glial tissue proliferation and the vessels around may show sheathing or attenuation. Consecutive optic atrophy, on the other hand, is due to an optic atrophy which occurs due to loss of it or damage to the retinal ganglion cells. So here you can see it's an RP, retinitis pigmentosa, the waxy pallor of the disc, attenuation of the vessels, and the bone speckle changes, if you can see. So this is a consecutive optic atrophy due to retinitis pigmentosa. The fund is here. Again, there is optic uh, disc pallor or atrophy with attenuation of the vessels. So this is a case of um, a consecutive optic atrophy due to central artery occlusion. The vessels are very much narrow. So when we are dealing with the case of disc pallor, the questions we need to answer is it is a true disc pallor? What is the cause of disc pallor? What is the diagnosis? Is it a progressive, progressive condition or static? So first I'll go through um, general clinical approach. Um, the, the diagnosis or the cause of the disc pallor, uh, we need to come to the diagnosis uh, going through a different stages. We should have it. We should know the, uh, it, it should, uh, the things to be considered are age of the patient, gender, laterality, systemic conditions, and a good thorough history. So age is important. For example, when we are dealing with children, if you're seeing an optic disc pallor, we would be thinking more in terms of perinatal forces or any hypoxia, any neurological conditions. Was there any um, rage intracranial tension? But if going up the age, younger children, we would consider hereditary optic neuropathies or optic neuritis, either due to typical or atypical causes. And furthermore, as the age advances in middle age and elderly, ischemic causes and inflammatory conditions or compressive would be considered. Gender, uh, in certain conditions, like for example, lebers, you know, th this is more common in males and uh, meningiomas, that is more common in females. Laterality, I've already discussed, and systemic conditions is also important. You should take a good systemic history, um, any underlying conditions, uh, diabetes, hypertension, which could be a risk factor for ischemic events, or any multiple sclerosis or NMO, which could be a risk factor for optic neuritis like that. And clinical history, onset-wise, Sudden onset is more in favor of neuritis, ischemic events, but subacute onset, hereditary, or demyelinating or compressive events. So, uh, good ocular examination is already discussed before, involves uh, best character visual activity, fields, color vision, pupils. Look for any proptosis, which would be there in gliomas or meningiomas. Check for other cranial nerves, extraocular movements, discolor, cup margins. OCT is helpful not only to confirm the retinal staining, but also in follow up. ERG can be useful in certain conditions, like for example, corn dystrophies, where you know, sometimes the subtle retinal changes will only be there with temporal pallor. In such conditions, ERG will be useful. A good systemic examination, examination for BP, anemia, lymph nodes, CVS, and CNS examination should be done. And investigation, this is general investigation. So, the, uh, it, and every investigation should be uh, case based. This involves complete blood count, paraphysia to see if there is any anemia or any infections, uh, ESRC reactive protein, so giant cell arthritis or any infections, MRI, neuroimaging, nutritional serum, B12 and folate levels. And in certain conditions, especially case states, we, uh, we can ask for heavy metal screening, torch infections, especially in infants who have this pallor, in hereditary condition, LHO and mutation or APA1, OPA1 mutations, LP and neurology workup, if you are suspecting any neurological conditions or demyelinating, and in cases of post-inflammatory uh, neuro uh, optic atrophy, uh, other than demyelinating, uh, you can uh, do blood investigations to rule out sarcoidosis and immunology workup, TB and syphilis, and thyroid functions if they are suspecting like a thyroid optic neuropathy. So now we will go into um, a few key scenarios. So first one is a 46-year-old male who was referred due to decreased vision with a slowly progressive with history of headache. The visual acuity in both eyes was 618, and there was defective color vision, and the pupils were sluggish. So if you look at the disc, the disc was pale temporarily in both eyes with um, temporal hemianopia, bilateral temporal hemianopia. It was more so superior quadrant anopia, which was extending inferiorly. This uh, type of field defect is, um, um, is very typical of cellular tumors, and uh, especially if it is starting superiorly and extending inferiorly. 
and OCT of the RNFL was done, which confirmed that there is very papillary RNFL thinning temporarily, and uh, ganglion cell loss nasally, which is a papillomacular bundle. So we did an MRI, which confirmed that there is an adenoma at the pituitary, and this, this optic dispalor was due to a pituitary adenoma, and the patient underwent surgery by the neurosurgeon, and the patient had improvement in vision and field. So this uh, case is highlighting the importance of neuroimaging in a case of dispalor, especially when you are seeing temporal dispalor along with um, uh, typical bitemporal field effects. So now I would like to uh, explain why an bowtie atrophy occurs in a pituitary adenoma. Uh, but bowtie atrophy is um, mm, uh, seen in cellular tumors or sometimes in optic tract lesions. So this is the bowtie atrophy where the temporal and the nasal part of the disc is fade. So why it happens is because of the crossing of the nasal fibers at the chiasm. So which are the nasal fibers? The nasal fibers are the fibers which are nasal to the fovea. So this includes the papillomacular bundle, which is actually converging onto the temporal side that is here, which is fade, and the fibers nasal to the disc, which is converging onto the nasal side. So that is why there is a bowtie atrophy in pituitary tumors. So if you're seeing a disc like that with optic atrophy or pallor, with shunt vessels, you should consider, this is typically uh, described in optic nerve meningiomas as seen in middle-aged females. So going on to the second case, is a 37 year old female who did, presented with diminution of vision in both eyes with a best corrective visual acuity of 69. So again, there was temporal pallor of the disc in both eyes and the field showed a centrocecal scotomas. The uh, RNFL thinning was uh, confirmed on OCT. So in such a case with a temporal pallor with central scotomas, the differential diagnosis should include a nutritional optic neuropathy or as I said, a post neurotic uh, optic, uh, new, uh, new, optic atrophy, a toxic optic neuropathy, a hereditary optic neuropathy or a compressive optic neuropathy. So this patient, in such cases, we should take a history uh, which should include a history of any toxins, any is he a smoker, is she an alcoholic, consumed methanol, medications like azambutol, INH, amiodarone, or quinine, taking history whether the patient is a vegetarian, uh, headache and diplopia throughout, compressive lesions, occupation index, working with chemicals, any episodes of double vision, weakness, or tingling in their arms or legs to rule out demyelinating conditions. In our patient was vegetarian, and the blood investigation showed that she had anemia with decreased vitamin D12 levels. So that was a case of a nutritional optic neuropathy, and the patient had supplements. So going on to the third case, this is a 68-year-old male who presented a decreased vision in the right eye of one month duration, and that decreased vision at that time was sudden. He uh, is diagnosed to be heart cell and old cerebrovascular accident. He's a reformed smoker and alcoholic. At presentation, visual activity in the right eye was no perception of light, and the left eye was 6 by 6, and there was an apparent tubular defect. So that is a fundus. The disc is pale in the right eye. The vessels, was, there was slight narrowing. And the left eye, again, the disc is normal with slight narrowing of the vessels. So what are the differentials here? Compressive optic neuropathy, but it's uh, not very... Uh, compressive optic neuropathy usually presents with a slowly progressive decrease in vision rather than a rapid sudden decrease in vision. GCA, that should be considered. It's a 68-year-old with um, 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 sudden drop in vision and that too, uh, severe drop in vision. So uh, the history that should be uh, taken include um, as uh, Dr. Adam said, we have to take history of jaw claudication, temporal arteries, whether it is pulsatile and non gender And um, the other differential is superior ophthalmic artery occlusion. But uh, in that case, the patient's vessels, they were all not that narrowed as we would expect in a superior ophthalmic artery occlusion. And PION is another differential, especially because the patient is a vascular fat. And also in GCA, the patient can have PION. So the blood investigation or the investigation that we should consider include complete blood count to rule out GCA, ESRC reactive protein, MRI brain and orbits. Carotid Doppler should be considered and risk factors should be assessed because it's an ischemic, if at all, it's an ischemic optic neuropathy. And what was found to be positive in our patient was that on CT angiogram, there was occlusion of the right internal carotid artery from its origin into the cavernous sinus. So the most probable diagnosis is posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which should have happened due to hyperperfusion of the optic nerve due to occlusion of the internal carotid. So now, now if you're looking at a sectoral pallor like that, where there is pallor on the superior aspect of the optic nerve with the normal color down and an altitudinal visual field is defect, we should think about anti-ischemic optic neuropathy, that is post anti-ischemic optic neuropathy, this pallor or sectoral pallor. In such cases, look at the other disc, 
is that this uh, risk uh, district risk and um, investigate rule out risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, or high cholesterol and manage accordingly. So generally the management of optic atrophy that is to treat the underlying cause, the causative medication or toxin should be avoided, vitamin deficiency should be replaced and patient with low vision may benefit from low vision aids. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Angana. That is an excellent talk covering all aspects. So it tells us what all investigations uh, to do in, in, in these cases. Um, I have a question to Dr. Sachin here. Yeah. I have a question to Dr. Sachin. Is, uh, this when, when do we suspect higher order visual problems? I mean, uh, as you said, the basic examination is normal. So how can we... How do we go about how do we when do we suspect and how do we go about this? I mean you, you did show the, the special test that you do. Yeah, so when you look at a patient and the symptoms seem to be out of proportion to your basic eye examination, then you suspect two things. One is functional or non-organic visual disorder, and then you should suspect is you know higher visual processing disorder. So most often these patients who end up coming to me with these higher visual processing disorder were initially felt to have a functional disorder because you cannot find an abnormality of the afferent or the efferent system. So that's why I emphasize the point that do your basic eye examination and do it completely, both the afferent pathway and the efferent pathway. And if you cannot find a cause, that's when you should start suspecting uh, higher uh, cortical visual problems. I think as an ophthalmologist, it might be useful to have just one or two screening tests. Uh, you know, use, um, uh, you know, have them read something. The MN read is good, maybe a newspaper or a simple storybook, something, even one minute of listening to them will give you an idea if that's the problem. You can have, you can give them a picture of a home or a neighborhood and ask them to describe what's going on and you'll figure out if they're seeing the picture properly or not. Uh, I often use the clock drawing test as a sort of a screener for, uh, you know, uh, identifying any neglect problems. Most people who are educated, who know how to read a clock should be able to draw it. Uh, but if you find significant errors in there, then you start suspecting higher cortical visual problems. Again, you know, there are many formal tests which are done by neuropsychologists, but over the years, each of us will have our own pet testing or screening methods. Um, you can have them look at, you know, pictures of familiar figures, maybe sports stars, maybe some politicians that they can recognize that you know they should recognize, but they're not able to recognize, tells you that they have a face recognition problem or prosopagnosia. Thank you. It's something that we don't do as a routine. I think we should get to do that more and more. Yeah, it's time consuming. And that's why it's useful, you know, to have that paradigm where, you know, you've done everything, you know that there is no afferent problem, you know there's no afferent problem, then it's either functional or cortical. And so it's useful to have one or two screening tests that you can rapidly administer or somebody in your office uh, can rapidly administer. And if you have somebody like Niranjan with you, that'll save you a lot of time. Sachin, we are seeing a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, ATT-induced optic neuropathies nowadays. Ethambutol-induced optic neuropathies. Uh, I, I know that you must not be seeing a lot of those, but here there was a change in the uh, whole thing. So maybe Rohit and uh, Sir can also uh, tell us what is the treatment of such conditions where actually vision has gone down. Many patients come to us when initial visual acuity drop is there, like six by eighteen or so. When we stop, it may become uh, you know very uh, better very fast. But in those patients in whom the vision has dropped significantly, what do you? generally do. There are some, some papers coming out with some specific medicines and all. Yeah, I don't have much experience with ethambutol induced optic neuropathy and I'll defer to Dr. Sharma and uh, Rohit if he's around. Uh, 
but I think there is a, uh, it's like a hill, you know, if you cross a threshold, then it is completely reversible. And to my understanding, um, it's in butyl induced optic neuropathy is pretty much irreversible. Even in the early stages, when you stop the medicine, there will always be a problem if you test colors, you know, and other contrasts and things like that. I think especially in the older people, we have found that the reversibility is very poor. So the best thing would be to have uh, prevention and make sure that the uh, toxicity doesn't happen. And we have to keep on uh, telling our medical uh, physicians to keep guard of the dose that they are giving, which many a times in tuberculosis patients, they are underweight. And the, usually the fixed dosage uh, kits are having something like 1,000 or 1,200 milligram of ethambutol, which is uh, much beyond uh, what you would be uh, recommending. So, and because it's a fi fixed dosage, it's a combination, there is a problem that uh, the patients are also not aware of uh, taking it simultaneously. So that is a big problem. And especially now that they have extended the dose of ethambutol in the recent guidelines, which uh, in spite of uh, the recommendations of the neuro ophthalmologists of India, uh, this has been there. Uh, the physicians generally feel that rifampicin causes uh, liver toxicity, which is more uh, known to them. So they are more worried about rifampicin and ethambutol they feel is uh, safer because it is out of sight. Can I add something, Dr. Gopal? Please. Yeah, so uh, ethambutol induced optic neuropathy actually is a cumulative toxicity. So most of the time, the toxicity happens after three, four months of usage. So initially, the patients don't have any complaints. And it's only after four months that most of the changes, you know, the visible perceptible changes happen. So and even if you stop the drug, it may continue to progress till the you know, uh, drug is excreted out of the body. So the risk factors would be having a concurrent renal dysfunction. So the patient has a renal dysfunction, hypertensive, smoker, elderly patient, all these are high risk factors for, you know, uh, poor recovery or, uh, you know, worsening of the symptoms. So we have patients who have been, uh, who have been asked to stop the drug, continue to progress, and uh, they come to us saying that ethambutol has been stopped, but the vision is dropping. What we have seen in our experience is that uh, if the patient doesn't have any high risk factors like concurrent renal disease and uh, the risk factors which I mentioned, they do recover, although they some do have some subtle uh, you know, effects of the toxicity like uh, you know, color vision loss and uh, field defect. Some sequelae will be there. Yeah, but they do recover. So the important thing is to do a baseline or, you know, ideally a baseline OCT in all these patients, if possible. So the the awareness should be there to all, given to all pulmonologists. So we are actually doing that, uh, you know, telling them to do a baseline OCT and optic neuropathy tests before they start the treatment. So they can, can follow up and pick it up earlier, you know, uh, before uh, the, they, the patient themselves come with these uh, Significant awareness is there for hydroxychloroquine, but not so much for ethanol. And hydroxychloroquine toxicity is not very, uh, yeah. you know, it, it's not yeah. very common. And also, once you stop the ethambutol, it's also important to stop INH also if it can't, I mean, uh, yeah. stop ethambutol as well as INH, because even INH is also known to produce uh, optic neuropathy. So we usually wait for a month, and if it doesn't improve, ask them to stop, substitute INH. With some other, uh, you know, drugs like levofloxacin or uh, other possible drugs. second line drugs. Uh, yeah. Right now, there was some publication about coenzyme Q uh, inhibitors. Sachin, any yes, experience uh, of coenzyme Q? There was um, any experience of coenzyme Q. Q or yeah. 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 So, yeah I mean, uh, there was some case. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. There were some yep. case reports uh, where uh, which, uh, we have gone through, which says that uh, a drug called idibelinone has been found to be uh, have some use in certain case reports, but not like um, a real, real study was done. Um, so whenever where we have patients with uh, ethambutol optic neuropathy, that is one of the things we were like uh, thinking about whether we should offer them with this drug. Um, 
but we don't have any like uh, real um, studies, but individual case reports are there. It says that some of them has been found to be useful. Drug is used in uh, Leber's hereditary yes. Yes. isn't it? So that's a drug which is uh, used in that. Uh, so what in Tamputol optic neuropathy, what we usually do is that we reassure the patient that most of the time they do recover. So that is very important. Otherwise, they'll go for alternative therapy and then they'll when they recover, they'll claim and give the, uh, you know, give the success to the alternative therapy. So it's very important to tell them that it is reversible if uh, you know if you have to look at the OCT and look at the if there is any significant GCL loss uh, then probably you can give them a guarded prognosis but most of the time uh, if we catch them early and uh, you know give, uh, tell them to stop the drug I, I find that they do reverse we have we've recently had two three patients in which uh, we were able to pick it up early and ask the physician to stop the drugs Within four months, uh, they had symptoms, but we stopped the drug. Uh, it was a slow recovery. Within four months, the patients uh, improved. So, uh, so exactly how how and when we don't know, but I think the uh, the toxicity usually starts after four months of treatment. Most of the time, it starts after four months of treatment. Monitoring with uh, OCT does give you a better idea rather than with VEP or with other optic neuropathy function tests. That is my experience. So uh, I think it's really important to tell them that, you know, they will recover, uh, uh, but they have to come back to you even if the vision is falling despite the treatment, put them on pyridoxin and some other vitamin supplements and uh, look for other parameters like uh, renal function tests and ask send them to the physician back for a total checkup for any risk factors. Dr. Sachin, do you see other optic neuro, other drug induced optics like I've seen, seen recently a case of linozolid. Linozolid induced optic neuropathy given for uh, MRSA uh, infection. So, such cases, do you is there any any other any treatment you can offer other than stopping the drug? Of course. No, I you know you're not talking about idiosyncratic drug reactions or very rare drug reactions, and the by and large the rule is stop it as early as you can. And once you've identified a drug as causing significant optic neuropathy, you know, in, in, in certain number of individuals, then recommend screening like we are doing for ethanbutol. Problem is most of these drugs seem to affect by, you know, they, they, they basically involve the mitochondria. Uh, they slow down the energy production and exoplasmic flow. That's why you see this early little bit of edema and then disc pallor after that. Um, whether or not it is reversible is 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 really a difficult thing uh, to determine. You know, uh, idebenon. So using the Leber's hereditary uh, optic neuropathy treatments, you know, we have used it for pretty much uh, most other forms of toxic optic neuropathy by giving coenzyme Q10 or um, uh, idebenon and so on. I, I really don't know if any of them have any meaningful impact in any of these conditions, including Libers, although we still prescribe it. Uh, I know that there are, there are trials going on for the use of idebenon um, you know, in Libers optic neuropathy. I, I don't know of any large scale studies in uh, toxic optic neuropathies where coenzyme Q10 or uh, idebenon have, have helped. And in India, the availability of idebenon has to be in multiple tablets. The dosage available is so uh, less and it's very costly. It is very, it's the same here. It is quite expensive. Daina ma'am, did you want to add something? Daina madam? You're mute, madam. Just, uh, no, just wanted to ask, uh, how often uh, would you like to see the patient, Nina, if uh, before symptoms start? I mean, uh, uh, after four months for the first, uh, after the baseline, of course, mm -hmm. the physician should, should send the patient for a baseline examination. But after that, how often would you want the patient to come back to you? Yeah, ma'am, uh, if they're coming for first, before the medicine has been started, of course, I usually ask them to come after three months only. Uh, then I also ask them if they have any symptoms, they should report early. But once it has been detected, I usually follow up on a monthly basis. Before symptoms uh, start after three months, after starting treatment. Yeah. And thereafter? 
thereafter if the if once uh, if, uh, if they have symptoms after stopping the drug then every month i follow up once the recovery starts then probably again two monthly or three monthly depending on the recovery gopal sir i wanted to make two points here so yes. yeah the, the toxicity is again the dose related one and many a times the physicians tend to prescribe like a fixed dose because if we look at the drug packet that are available the dot as directly absorbed treatment so it comes as a fixed dose combination and the patient has to take it whatever it is but actually it has to be a uh, weight based like milligram per kg and many of these patients with tuberculosis they have weight loss they are emaciated so the standard tablet that comes with actually becomes kind of an overdose over a period of time so that is how many of our patients end up getting the toxicity the cumulative toxicity that is one form and the second form which is more unusual than the cumulative toxicity is the retrobulbar neuritis that would be a sudden vision loss compared to this insidious and progressive one as in case of uh, cumulative toxicity so these patients would be like over any other retrobulbar neuritis with a sudden vision loss and one form which is more peculiar for ethambutal is the chiasmal neuritis where you see um, enhancement of the chiasma and some of them actually have this classical bitemporal hemianopia yeah. so that's another uh, place where ethambutal can affect the optic nerves and there again if you want to give ivmp that's a very dicey issue uh we have to consult the physician weigh the risks and pros or uh, the the pros and cons of giving ivmp for restoration of vision versus the flaring of of the tuberculosis so that decision has to be made in consultation with the physician and involving the patient too thank you niranjan i just wanted to share that uh, uh, you know one case of uh, lenasolid optic neuropathy which we had this child was on you know she, he was about 7 years 6 months the patient was on lenasolid for infective endocarditis presented 2 by 60 and 3 by 60 and this is the uh, picture of the right eye the left eye there was a little bit of disc edema uh, you know flash vp was normal in mri was normal this is the disc edema this is a fluorescent i did a iv methylprednisone or a vancomycin cover and vision improved to 6 by 12 and 6 by 80 these were the pictures after discadema resolved wow um that's the that's the case which i wanted to share very nice that's nice so uh, sai sir it's been a long night yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 but very 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 enjoyable i i skipped some talks in between but uh, rajesh uh, uh, yeah in your group photograph gopal yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. immediately after the after we cut out of out of youtube okay. yeah 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 nice talk any how uh, feedback on how many views on youtube gopal about 700 views okay that's good yeah for so it is a it is a wonderful uh, day started with uh, glaucoma afternoon was uh, uva it is an inflammation and finishing with pediatric ophthalmology and studies uh, pediatric ophthalmology studies mus and neuro ophthalmology i thank each one of you pradeep sharma sir thank you very much sir you've been here i mean as a pillar of our strength whenever we call you are there <laughs> my pleasure thank so you. much thank you so much sir <laughs> rohit is rohit i think has gone for that the meeting rajesh uh, are you there uh, thank you very much and sachin Uh, all the best for moving to your new place new location all the best we had a wonderful talk from you every time master class as uh, uh, i don't say uh, and uh, niranjan uh, saumya ma'am laila ma'am uh, thank you very much satish, and rehna and you. Arif. yeah satish. So, satish yeah thank you thank you very much thank you very much don't go yet i will it feels just... like the it feels like the second day of a conference one more day to go <laughs> that that sort of feeling the hard task master gopal intense <laughs> for the pgs so three more three more sessions